Okay, good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Exploring the Lord of the Rings. I'm Corey Olson, the Tolkien Professor. Happy to be joining you again. Uh, so, you know, we were able to do our class last week, and I did not uh, suspect at the time, of course, that that would be like the last class I would do all week last week, uh, as I ended up catching the flu, and it was a little bit awful for the whole second half of last week. So uh, I'm glad to be back this week. I have to say, after uh, finally, you know, feeling better and uh, catching up on sleep and everything over the weekend. Uh, I was already, uh, you know, excited to come back into class tonight. And then the we lost power this afternoon because we're having this ice storm up here uh, in New Hampshire. Um, and so my power went out and it was I, I was re remembering that line from uh, from chapter one. See, and then I lost power. Anxiety was intense. But then finally, so our, our power did come back and um and we're all set now. So uh, I am, as I say, very glad to be uh, uh, to be back with everybody. So tonight uh, we are going to uh, go into Bree. We have two passages left uh, in Chapter 8. Uh, but they're, of course, the passages that are the transition into uh, looking towards Bree here. Uh, we just uh, were seeing Tom Bombadil off. We'll still be waving goodbye to him here in the first passage. But uh, we had Tom Bombadil's final speech and final poem. Uh, at the end uh, last time. Uh, one quick announcement before we uh, start, though, that I wanted to make sure uh, to emphasize, and that is we have our first Europe conference uh, coming up. I, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about this. Uh, folks who have been fans of, uh, you know, Mythgard and the, the stuff that we've been doing, people have been really faithful uh, uh, podcast followers or, or attendees at our many classes and things. Um, uh, from Europe have been a very long-suffering bunch, I have to say. I know that my own personal time schedule, you know, I always have to schedule my classes around my family, which generally means that we're at this time of night. You know, 9.30 p.m. has been my time for years now that I've been doing stuff. Um, but I know that that's like 2.30, 3.30 in the morning for almost everybody in Europe. And so I, uh, I, I know how difficult it has been uh, to join in these things. Uh, so I am the more excited that our new set of uh, regional conferences is extending across the pond into uh, into Europe this year. Uh, so in April, April 28th, officially we've changed the, the date from the original date. Uh, April 28th now is the official date. Um, we are going to be uh, headed over to England uh, for Brit Moot or London Moot, uh, which I am super excited about. So I'm looking forward to being able to come over there and uh, uh, interact with a bunch of you in, you know, times which are natural to you. Now, I know I'm saying this at three o'clock in the morning for almost everybody uh, in Europe over there. Uh, but I get just to kind of start spreading the word for uh, for folks who are uh, who are who are over there? Uh, people who are who are going to be listening or watching this uh, uh, asynchronously. I hope that you will uh, be able to uh, to to come join us. So, anyway, it's going to be it's going to be great fun. So again, April twenty eighth in London. Um, you can go to LondonMoot.com or you can uh, go there's uh, links to the uh, to the to the event page on SignumUniversity.org as well. You can look down and see the see the links to London Moot. So. Um, should be uh, uh, should be should be really cool. I'm 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 very excited about it. All right, let us speaking about things I'm excited about. Let it, let us get to Bree here. Okay. Uh, so tonight's class called Welcome to Bree because we're going to be focusing primarily on all of the sort of prefatory material we get. Uh, Tolkien's uh, opening to chapter nine uh, is really interesting. It's really unusual. Um, very rarely does he pause the narrative for this long, especially at the opening of a chapter like this, uh, to give us this kind of long background history. We get a lot of background uh, about Bree. So I want to be looking at what we're getting and, uh, uh, and see you know, kind of where Tolkien is positioning us in relationship to Bree. We were talking last time about crossing boundaries, right? We're looking at, of course, crossing the boundary between Cardolan and Arthedain, right? Which was which was a big deal when they crossed it, and Tom remembered something sad about it. Um, but I was also talking in how, in sort of a, a bigger sense, this is a, a really interesting and important transition point for the narrative, right? We had the 
you know, the, the time of adventure descending upon the Shire, where, you know, the adventurous world breaks in on Frodo, like uh, in Bag End, right? Like it did on Bilbo at the, be- at the beginning of The Hobbit, though, of course, with different significance, right? And in different ways. But, um, but in both cases, you know, you had sort of adventure invading the Shire, right? Though the invasion was a little bit more thorough and a little bit more aggressive, obviously, right? In, in The Lord of the Rings. And so we had this whole segment of the crossing of the Shire, this sort of walking holiday, which turns into a much more serious adventure, leading then to this uh, set of three chapters that we've been studying now for many months uh, with Tom Bombadil as the centerpiece of those three chapters, right? The House of Tom Bombadil flanked by the uh, old forest chapter and the Barrow Downs chapter. Um, so that so, you know, we have had really sort of one section, right, which was the first uh, four chapters, first five chapters, really, um, through the conspiracy unmasked, the Shire bit. And now we've had these three chapters of adventures, right? Their first real adventures. Think about um, the line. Well, I say think about it. We haven't gotten there yet. Right. But when uh, when they get to the to Bilbo's trolls. Uh, Frodo is going to, or the narrator is going to recall that incident as Bilbo's first successful adventure, right? Obviously, Frodo uh, and his companions have their first adventure. We can decide amongst ourselves whether we think it was successful or not, right? Um, They have their first adventure long before, geographically long before Bilbo had his first adventure. Um, But that first sort of period of adventure, the greater Tom Bombadil region, is now done and passing into Brie, we're really beginning a, a whole new segment. And so it's at this moment that Tolkien is going to back up and say, okay, here's where we're, here's where we're going. This is a brand new world that we're entering into, right? Not just the world of dark adventure, right? The old forest where, you know, like Fatty Bulger's nurse told crazy stories about, and there are, hob- you know, whispered legends about the Barrow Downs and stuff like that. Uh, no, this is a different kind of, border that we're crossing here, right? A different kind of land um, that we are um, uh, that we are heading to. Um, and so again, this is why I find it so interesting the sort of the angle that Tolkien takes in preparing us for that. But first, the end of chapter 8. Then he turned back, he of course being Tom Bombadil, right? Then he turned, tossed up his hat, leaped on Lumpkin's back, and rode up over the bank and away, singing into the dusk. The hobbits climbed up and watched him until he was out of sight. "'I am sorry to take leave of Master Bombadil,' said Sam. "'He is a caution and no mistake. I reckon we may go a good deal further and see not better, nor queerer. But I won't deny I'll be glad to see this prancing pony he spoke of. I hope it'll be like the green dragon away back home. What sort of folk are they in Bree?' You know something I never thought about before? Tom, uh, Sam's calling Tom Bombadil Master Bombadil. Why Master? I mean, on the one hand, it seems obvious, right? Uh, you know, Tom Bombadil is Master. We've been over that several times, right? And so in that way, it's a, it's a completely appropriate title. And yet it seems totally counterculturally applied. Do you see what I mean? Um, that is to say, oh, okay, sorry, did my audio blink? Sorry about that. Uh, not sure why that happened. Um, anyway, uh, uh, okay, you heard counterculturally applied, JJ. Thank you for that uh, specific detail. On the one hand, calling him master, calling him master Bombadil seems totally sensible. He's the master. Right. What else would you call him if not the master? And yet Master Bombadil is a very specific within their culture. It's a very specific title. It has very specific meaning. And the specific meaning that master has when you call somebody by their last name with word master in front of it seems to me almost comically inappropriate to Tom Bombadil. Right. Um, You remember when we saw this with Farmer Maggot. Right. Remember when Farmer Maggot met uh, Pippin, right, and recognized him, and he says, young Master Pippin, excuse me, Mr. Peregrine Took, I should say. Remember how he corrects himself, right? 
Masters, what you say to kids? Exactly. It's for little boys, Veronica. Um, not little boys of a certain class, right? Uh, 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 aristocratic little boys, you call them the young master, right? Um, so I mean, Pippin was Master Pippin to Farmer Maggot because he's in the Took family, right? Uh, Sam is not Master Gamgee, right? It doesn't sound like he ever was Master Gamgee. Um, now, Catriona, you're right. Sam does call Frodo Master Frodo, and that is a different usage of it, right? He calls, uh, he calls Frodo his master, right? Because he's the servant and Frodo is his master, right? And he calls him Master Frodo, though. Not Master Baggins. He would never call him Master Baggins. Never, Sam never, ever, ever calls Frodo Master Baggins, right? Because that is the is the diminutive title, right? Um, so, uh, uh, anyway. Um, yeah, I don't know. You're right that we get, uh, Tony Mead is reminding us that Bilbo does call the gaffer Master Hamfast as a form of politeness, right? So it's clearly not just for juveniles. Is it the same kind of, is it the same kind of, uh, uh, respect of that kind? Is Sam calling Tom Bombadil, Master Bombadil, parallel to Bilbo calling the gaffer Master Hamfast? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um... Yes, yes, Valoria, you're right. Um, it is true that young people in the in the South in America do that all the time, uh, Miss Jenny or Mr. Dave. I kind of miss that, actually. We, they, we used to do that down in Delaware uh, when I lived there. That was below that cultural line. Uh, so uh, geographically below that cultural line, I mean. Um, and I actually kind of, uh, uh, actually kind of, kind of miss that. Uh, it's a really interesting sort of compromise between instructing your kids to call an adult by their first name, which seems a little bit inappropriate, um, and having them use, you know, like your last, you know, just like Mr. and your last name or something, which seems unnecessarily formal. Um, but um, anyway, uh, <laughs> Lincoln says maybe Sam meant it as something like a job description. Well, see, Lincoln, that's what I find interesting about this is that I wouldn't be spending nearly so much time thinking about what is the significance of him calling him Master Bombadil in this way, uh, if not for the fact that, of course, Master is such a peculiarly relevant and insignificant uh, uh, term to use of Tom Bombadil, right? Um, but um, uh, yeah, anyway. Um, Yeah. Well, it's all kind of a tangle to me, figuring out Master... I had forgotten Master Hamfast. That's the one that I'm, that I'm, that I'm thinking about here, because I had forgotten that one. That's a really, that's a really interesting point. Um, yeah. Um, and yet, Tony, this is... We, we did get a chunk of Sam dialogue at the barrow, right? Like, uh, where the where are my clothes, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, now, that's a good point, Mad Violinist. Maybe I'm misremembering. Maybe, or rather, maybe I'm slurring together. Mr. Frodo, he does call him Mr. Frodo, and he calls him Master. Does he ever call him Master Frodo? Maybe I'm combining those two things in my head. That seems quite likely. Yeah. Mr. Frodo. And Master. 
Master is his title, right? When he's not referring to him by name, he's going to call him Master. Mr. Frodo is like, he's a mister because he's a landowner, right? Um, and he's calling him Mr. Frodo because he's not Mr. Baggins. He, they're on two intimate terms for him to call him Mr. Baggins. And anyway, he, he there's like old Mr. Bil, Mr. Bilbo and Mr. Frodo to differentiate the two Mr. Bagginses. Um, yeah, yeah. And you're right, Mad Violinist, there are very few examples of times when Sam just calls him Frodo. And when he does, that would seem to be very significant, right? If he, when, he, when he just calls him Frodo. Um, sometimes we'll even call him Mr. Frodo, sir, right? Um, yeah. Anyway, yeah, so... So back to Master Bombadil. Is it possible? Tony is suggesting maybe, um, maybe he's um, Sam is not being consistent about his formalities. Um, which is possible. But I don't know. Um, Well, Crystal, he could call him Mr. Bombadil. Crystal is asking, he, he would use an honorific. He wouldn't call him Tom, right? Uh, what other term could he have used? Um, Mr. Is, suggests itself, right? Um, yeah, I mean, and he seems to be using Bombadil as if it were his surname, Right. It's, which especially seems likely since um, that it's at least going to sort of seem that I mean, It's not that Tom Bombadil has a family name exactly. Right. Like, Ian, you know, he's a Tom Bombadil of the old forest Bombadils. Right. Descended from a long line of Bombadils. So, of course, Bombadil isn't his surname in the same way that, uh, you know, doesn't mean the same thing that a hobbit surname does. And yet his first name, Tom, is such a common hobbit name that it certainly has all of the form and it deliberately appears to have the form of first name, surname. Um, yeah. Maybe it is just an acknowledgement of Tom being the master, Irindus. Maybe he, that's what, see, that's what I think I'm, that's what I think Irindus I'm kind of coming back to, right? Let me, let me, um, uh, let me just say that plainly, right? Here's what I would like this passage to mean, but I, I'm always careful about this. Like I, I, I fight very hard because when I when I acknowledge in myself a desire to read a passage in a particular way, I'm always a little skeptical, right? Uh, but um, what I would like that to be is Tom base or Sam basically rendering into a title, like acknowledging. You know, Tom Bombadil is master, right? Sam has sort of processed that. And so he does want to use some honorific. And so he chooses uh, to use, um, he chooses to call him master, right? Because Tom is the master, right? So he's just sort of acknowledging that and using it in a form which is like the form for normal, you know, forms of address in the Shire, but deviating from those forms, uh, because it's Tom Bombadil, right? You know, he's so he's not just sort of squeezing Tom Bombadil into the social hierarchy of the Shire, right? Um, but rather that he's that he's sort of though staying within that basic form is deviating from it. That's kind of what what I hope to be true of this, but I'm not 100 percent convinced that that's actually correct. Um, uh, Erukeb points out that. Um, of course, 
if Sam was listening to Goldberry, and he probably was, um, then he would know that Tom Bombadil is not a landowner, right? Because he doesn't own the land. It, the, the land all belongs to itself. Uh, and so he would know that master is a better title than mister, uh, because mister is for landowners. Um, possibly. Possibly. Um, yeah, Kyle is suggesting that uh, this could be Sam's reaction to enchantment. He sees Tom Bombadil as the master through his experience in enchantment, and then he moves on uh, 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 to you know wanting to go back to the safety of the 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 prancing pony uh, as well. Um, Fourth Dauntless, we'll have to pay attention and look. I mean, if somebody wants to look it up, they can. Um, Sam using the title master for anyone else. Uh, again, he calls Frodo master. Does he ever apply it in this way? Do we ever get a master somebody? Um, does he call anyone else master as a, you know, a kind of honorific in this, in this way? Um, that's, uh, that's a really great question. Um, and I can't, I'm, I'm not sure I can remember right offhand. Obviously I'm forgetting all kinds of things here tonight. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I I can't remember. I can't remember hearing Sam refer to Elrond, Master Elrond's. Yeah, yeah. That was because I mean clearly again he's not just going to call him Elrond, right? Sam would never do that. Sam would never be like, oh, as Elrond said, right? You know, Elrond, my buddy, right? He and I were first first name basis. Sam doesn't doesn't act like that. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, Mad Violinist is a great question. How does all this relate to Sam's lack of dialogue through these three chapters? Um, uh, and he tends to read this as the sort of reserve you give someone who is uncanny uh, and whom you don't entirely trust. Um, so that Sam has been kind of untrust Ding, right? We last really had a conversation with Sam uh, at Old Man Willow. We don't hear a peep out of Sam. He doesn't even dream, right? We don't even get his dreams. He's the only one who doesn't dream. We don't get a peep out of Sam during the entire time that they're in the house of Elrond. Or Elrond. They're in the house of Tom Bombadil. Um, and I think that that's really interesting. But I don't know exactly what to make of it. Um... Sam longed for elves, right? Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Sam longs for elves, right? He, that was his, you know, to see elves was his desire upon leaving the Shire. And then remember when we meet Goldberry and we get that, you know, my favorite simile in the Lord of the Rings, right? The, uh, the comparison to somebody who opens the cottage door, right? To beg for a drink of water and is greeted by an elf queen clad in living flowers. Um, you know, that kind of thing everybody can relate to. Uh, remember the contrast that the narrator insists upon between the experience of meeting Goldberry and the experience of meeting the elves. And I don't really understand. I don't really know, um, what, we're supposed to make of it, right? What we're supposed to make of Sam's silence, therefore, is he, um, I mean, I can't imagine he dislikes Tom and Goldberry, right? That he's not moved by it. He would have to be, wouldn't he? So is his silence, the silence of someone who is reverent and silent during his time there? Um, or, or is there another explanation? Uh, you know, I, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, exactly. The mad violinist, we don't hear from him again until he asks where his clothes are after being rescued from the barrow. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Yeah, Mad Violinist, I agree that the, the language around that simile, I, it's it's not, the, I, I don't think that they, um, 
Yeah, that doesn't sound like a Sam simile, right? Exactly. I don't know, maybe. Uh, JJ thinks they're a bit above his likes and dislikes. But we don't even get that from him, JJ, right? We don't get any reaction like that from Sam. Um, Tony thinks... uh, Tony thinks that it's awe. It's likely to be awe. Um, Okay. All right. Um, they're a bit, a bit above his responses and non-responses. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> All right. Hang on a second. I gotta go back because several of you are, re- are frantically researching uses of the of the term master throughout. The, so, so let's go back to that for a second. Um, Matt was finding a whole bunch of really, you know, really important references that I, that I think are really good. Eric, have I like the fact that Mary is called Master Bag? That, that's a good one, right? Um, uh, Elfhelm calls him Master Bag. Pack yourself up, Master Bag, right? Um, but see, that's probably diminutive form, I would think, most likely. But anyway. Um, the thing that, um, uh, the thing that Matt was just pointing to, which is really, really interesting, is that we do see some people referred to as master in a way which makes it look like it ranks above Mr. Right. Um, uh, old master Gorbadoc is what the one that I found most interesting, uh, Matt, of the examples that you give. Also, the fact that Theoden and others will refer to, Ga- to Gandalf as Master Gandalf, right? Uh, Treebeard does too, right? Um, now, th- those I'm a little bit less interested in because that's not necessarily this in sort of Shire culture context, right? But the Master Gorbadoc one is. Um, old master Gorbadoc, he's important, right? Um, and so it does seem in that sense that he's, I mean, he, he's, he's, he's not just, he's not just Mr., right? He's not just Mr. Gorbaduck. Uh, he's above Mr. And so is called Master. Um, so it seems to be, uh, based on that model, Matt, I would then come back to the question of Hamfast, right? And say, Wherein does the politeness lie, right? Um, Bilbo calls him Master Hamfast, right? What does that suggest? What does that imply? How is he being polite to him? Um, And I would think, now, he wouldn't call him Mr. Gamgee, right? Because to say that would be to say something that's simply untrue. He's not a landowner, right? Um, And especially since he, Hamfast Gamgee, is apparently Bilbo's tenant, right? It would seem uh, like particularly not polite, actually, right? Almost mocking even uh, to to call one of your own tenants, uh, speak to one of your own tenants as if you were pretending he was a landowner, right? That would be just kind of weird. But um, the, but calling him Master Hamfast is putting him in the Master Gorbaduck category, which seems to be one of like, general rep like you are he he is referring to him as um uh exactly marianne he considers him an expert on potatoes right he is he is uh, uh venerable because he's old right uh so he is venerable uh and he is the the head of his family right the gamgee family the gamgee family are lower class family they're not land holding family but but he's you know that he has children and grandchildren presumably already and uh, you know sam has a couple he's the youngest sibling uh or the youngest brother anyway uh he's got two older brothers who probably have kids um and uh yeah so he he's the head of clam gamgee and he's he's old and venerable and wise right in his own sphere and everything uh so i think it's i think that the kind of respect that he's showing them is that by calling him Master Hamfast, he seems to be treating him as, you know, someone who is, uh, Bilbo is treating him as somebody who is someone who is at least his own peer, right? Not economically in that way, right? Not, not, not strictly in terms of class, but just in terms of somebody who is worthy of respect, right? Um, and, uh, so, Because the Master Gorbadoc thing would work well that way. So in that sense, Master is kind of at the top and the bottom, right? It's what they call the kids, but it's also what they call the sort of the highest uh, level. But the interesting there is that it's Master and then first name, right? 
It's, he's, he doesn't call him, he calls him Master Hamfast. He doesn't call him Master Gamji, right? Nor does the narrator refer to old Master Brandybuck, right? It's old Master Gorbaduck. Um, so that still means that Master Bombadil is a different pattern. Do we see that pattern anywhere? Is there anywhere else that we see the pattern of Master and the last name, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, okay. But I'm done talking about mastery now. Unless somebody can, can come up with another example of master applied to a surname, specifically a surname. Um, if unless you come up with one of those, then I'm done talking about master stuff. So stop posting about it because there's there I mean, there's so many. I know it, you, you're many of you are doing searches uh, in your e text for master, which is great, and that comes up with lots of uh, really useful things. Um, but uh, ah, thank you, thank you, Aragorn, Master Underhill. Yes, good. Matt was just saying that too. Okay. Tom is going to, or Butterbur, rather, is going to call Frodo Master Underhill. Okay, there it is. Okay, so does that mean it's a familiarity thing, then? See, no, 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 not Master of the Hall, Kyle. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a title, right? That's like mayor. That's, that's, I'm not interested in that. That's a different thing. Um, and does somebody say Master Butterbur? Maybe, but Master Underhill. Okay, right. So that suggests... That familiarity is a factor, right? Um, because Butterbur's just meeting him, right? So he's not going to call him by his first name. In fact, Frodo didn't even give his first name, right? He just calls himself Mr. Underhill. Um, the Mr. is how he introduces himself, right? So when Butterbur upgrades that to Master Underhill... That is presumably a sign of respect, therefore, I'm thinking, right? Um, oh, good. Thank you, Harnuth. Very good. Uh, uh, kind Master Fernie. Yes, good. We'll get that as well with Bill Fernie. Um, and that is clearly sarcastic, right? Uh, an afterthought of kind Master Fernie. Uh, so that that's a sarcastic use of the honorific in that way. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah, Aragorn, I think that, uh, Sam calling Ted Sandyman Master Sandyman would similarly be, actually, that's a doubly biting thing, right? As he knows Ted Sandyman very well. Uh, and so to refer to him just by his last name like that, um, uh, that is, He's not unfamiliar to him at all, um, but also not worthy of respect. So I would think that there's a double sarcasm there. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, Harneth, I know that was Strider. Did I misspeak there? I, I, I knew that was Strider saying kind Master Fernie. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Tony, I agree. This would be a great paper topic, wouldn't it? Looking at the different uses of master and thinking about the significance of that, uh, thinking about uh, the, the the question of what it means to be master, right? Which was raised, of course, uh, so uh, so intriguingly, so forcefully uh, in the Bombadil chapters, and then thinking about expanding that out through and looking at who is called master, both as a title in that way, right? Master something or other, people who are just called master, by themselves, right? People who have the title master, like master of the hall, um, all kinds of things. And again, just sort of think about what are the different significances of that and, and e emphasis of that. <laughs> oh, quick, that might be a master's thesis, but probably not, uh, probably not quite enough there, <laughs> but I, but I like the idea. Uh, <laughs> anyway. All right. Oh yes. Um, Pontine, right, and the Master Ring, of course, is lurking behind all of this stuff, too, right? That other idea of mastery, uh, which is so central, right, to the uh, uh, to the whole story. Okay, good. Now, I'm totally and officially done talking about 
uh, master stuff. Uh, so let's get on to Sam's second sentence, uh, which Karita has been wanting to talk about for a while. He's a caution and no mistake. Um, this is a great phrase. Uh, uh, what exactly does it mean? He's a caution and no mistake. What does Sam mean by that? He's a caution. Now, I don't think it means that you should be cautious about him, right? I don't think that that's the that's what he means here. Um, a real character, Lincoln. Yes. Yes, a real character uh, that seems to me to be getting at the point. Um, uh, he's a wonder. Yeah, something like that. Um, yes, Tony says meeting Tom has shown him how strange the world outside the Shire might be. Um, yeah, that's the kind of uh, that's the kind of thing. Exactly. Um, so, like, my sense. Uh, so he's outside of Sam's experience. Marianne suggests. Yeah, exactly. I, my general understanding of that as an idiom, right? When you say that somebody is a caution, it's like, like a caution against taking things for granted. Like you shouldn't make assumptions, right? Um, yeah, Karita, kind of like he's a trip. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you should be cautious about, like, if, if there's anything, the thing that you're actually, like, where, where, where caution of any kind actually comes in to that expression is, like, it's like, that'll teach you to, like, make assumptions about people that you meet, right? Because he is uh, um, unexpected, right? Um, uh, that's the... Um, Yeah, yeah. Um, he's not your ordinary bloke. Pay attention, Boomful. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's exactly the kind of thing. Um, I I believe that we're gonna that we're 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 seeing that he's a, he's a showstopper. Tony says. Yeah, weird but awesome. Yes, exactly. Um, I, he's a caution. I I don't think there is any call for thinking about that in any kind of negative sense. I, I, I think this is, this is a, this is approval, right? Um, he's saying he's really funny. You know, he's saying that he's, you know, Sam really likes him. And, and what's more is not just likes him, but was really amused by him. Amusingly non-conforming or perhaps outrageous. Yeah. Harnett, that's a great explanation. I really like that one. Um, yeah. Weirdo in a cool way. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Uh, a person or thing that astonishes or causes mild apprehension. A, a person or thing that astonishes, certainly. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, he's a caution and no mistake. I reckon we may go a good deal further and see not better nor queerer. Right? And there, I mean, I think you have Sam's explanation of what he meant, right, uh, by that. Um, you may go a good... you. you you may go a good deal further. We may go a long way before we see anything that is either better or stranger than Tom Bombadil. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Good. Um, and I like the fact, I, I like the fact that Sam emphasizes um, both that will see not better nor queerer, right? He acknowledges that not only is Tom Bombadil good, he's extraordinarily good, right? We, we, we might go a long way before we see anything better than Tom Bombadil. And I don't think he means better in the sense of, like, more noteworthy, right? Better in, like, a tourist sense, Um a more remarkable thing to see. I, I don't think that, I think he means better like he's good, right? Um, 
Yeah. But, um, uh, but he is as queer as he is good, right? He is as strange as he is good. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and Tony, yeah, the names of inns are, um, uh, the names of inns are, are like the names of ships, right? In, in fact, sometimes they're quite similar. Uh, but uh, yeah, the names of inns are like the names of ships. Uh, so yeah, they are, they are, they are, they are, they are official. They are, you would, you would italicize or underline them generally. Um, yeah, good. Um, but I like his transition there, but I won't deny that I'll be glad to see this prancing pony he spoke of. Right. Uh, but I won't deny meaning I, I, so I have to admit that what he's really, so, I mean, the transition in his thought there, uh, is really interesting, right? He's really enjoyed their time with Tom Bombadil. He thinks he's awesome, weird, but awesome, right? Awesome and weird. But I won't deny I'll be glad to see this prancing pony. Right? Why does he start that sentence with but? Why not and, right? Well, Tom Bombadil was great, and I'm looking forward to the prancing pony now, too, right? The fact that he says but suggests that he's thinking about the transition from the Tom Bombadil world into the re- returning to the normal world. Exactly, Boomful. He's, he's, he's going back to... Um, he's going back to the, the normal world it, and he won't deny he's going to be kind of glad to go back to the normal world, right? It's been great hanging out in Tom Bombadil's world, right? Really interesting at the beginning and the end, uh, but uh, you know, anyway Tom Bombadil's been awesome but you know, a nice pub like the Green Dragon sounds like just the thing right now, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie, right? I think that a bit of normal pub time sounds really good. Yeah, a return to normalcy seems to be something that he is confessing that he's really longing for, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Stephanie, I think when he transitions from hoping that the prancing pony will be like the green dragon, right, that, that again, that, that clearly shows his desire for something normal again, Right after the very strange adventures in the forest in the Barrow Downs, and in the house of Tom Bombadil, for that matter. Um, but uh, exactly, Carita, he wants something nice and normal, preferably with beer. Um, so his f- final question there, Stephanie, what sort of folk are they in Bree? Is a little bit um, uncertain, anxious. Right? It, it is. It is going to be comparatively normal. Right. We're not going into another totally strange alien world now, are they? Right? Uh, what sort of folk are they in Bree? And then we get, hey, second slide. We're going to get to the end of the chapter. We're totally going to do it. We're not going to get to Harry Goatleaf, but that's okay. There are hobbits in Bree, said Mary, as well as big folk. I dare say it will be home-like enough. The pony is a good inn by all accounts. My people ride out there now and then. Now and again, sorry. It may be all we could wish, said Frodo, but it is outside the Shire all the same. Don't make yourselves too much at home. Please remember, all of you, that the name of Baggins must not be mentioned. I am Mr. Underhill, if any name must be given. They now mounted their ponies and rode off silently into the evening. Darkness came down quickly as they plodded slowly downhill and up again until at last they saw lights twinkling some distance ahead. Before them rose Bree Hill, barring the way, a dark mass against misty stars, and under its western flank nestled a large village. Towards it they now hurried, desiring only to find a fire and a door between them and the night. Okay. Um. Yeah, yeah. Mary's emphasis, right? I love... Mary's answer to Sam's question is very politic, right? Um, Bree, of course, is primarily a city of big folk, 
right? Uh, it is not really home-like, exactly, right? This is a strange land compared to the Shire. Um, they are coming into the land of men for the first time. But there are hobbits there, right? That Bree is a joint community of the big and the little folk. Uh, and Mary emphasizes that very tactfully, I think. There are hobbits in Bree, as well as big folk, right? Um, uh, so, yes. So let's, let's front end the familiar for Sam, right? Um, and yeah, uh, Carita, I, I too like that emphasis. I dare say it will be home-like enough. It's not actually going to be home-like. It's not going to be exactly like home. But it'll be home-like enough to be okay, right? I agree that's a significant enough there, uh, Carita. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, Lady Shmebiwak is asking why the name Underhill... Um, Oh, good. Lincoln points out that Crick Hollow was barely home-like for Sam, right? It was... But, Lincoln, actually, this is a really interesting contrast, right? Crossing the Brandywine was a big deal. Sam had never been across the Brandywine. He felt like... Remember, there's that moment when he's looking back across the water on the ferry, and he's feeling like he's leaving the whole world that he's ever known behind, right? And going into this strange and foreign land. And yet, when he gets there... Buckland is not actually all that much different, right? Folks lock their doors at night, which is a little strange, and they uh, occasionally have been known in theory to use boats on the river. Not that Sam ever sees anybody using any apart from the ferry, um, but um, but that's exactly the point, right, Lincoln? So he gets there, and he feels like he's in strange, you know, folk are queer over there in Buckland, right? And yet he there's, he's not actually seen any evidence of that strangeness. It's not actually weird compared to... It's, in fact, quite homelike, uh, which is emphasized in particular about Crick Hollow, right? And how uh, all of uh, Frodo stuff from Bag End, right, has been laid out to make Crick Hollow look as much like Bag End as possible, and it feels very welcoming. Uh, and uh, anyway, there we have... Uh, anyway, and, and there, there they arrive. And so, yeah, it's different for Sam. But it's, it's nothing compared to the difference, really, that he's about to, uh, that he's about to experience. But back to the, um, back to the Underhill question, which is a good question. Um, Lincoln suggests that Underhill is probably like Smith for hobbits. Perhaps I mean there are Underhills right who live in Staddles, so uh, it, it does seem to be a common name uh, and kind of generic in the sense of, like, most hobbits live under hills, right? While it does have some specific resonance for Frodo and Bilbo, right, as they live in the hill in Hobbiton. Um, so, uh, you know, Underhill also, remember, was one of those things which was kind of involved in Bilbo's dragon names, right, his riddling names that he gave to Smaug, so there's some, like, fun family reference there. Um, I... Uh, it, it's just exactly what Eruheb was remembering and was in the middle of quoting uh, when I said it there. Um, absolutely. Uh, so I think that that's... Gandalf gives it to him, right? At the end of, or at the beginning of uh, chapter three, before he leaves, he says, uh, you know, when you go, go as, you know, t take a traveling name, go as Mr. Underhill. Um You know, why would he do that? To connect him to Bilbo, in some sense, as I think Frodo would be thinking of the riddling dragon names as well. Um, but also that it's a very common name, as we're suggesting, and Tony, as you're saying right now, uh, common enough not to draw attention, um, uh, but unique enough that someone in the know would know who it refers to. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, I mean, in fact, you know, Tony, it's even, it's not even just like some of their friends, right? Um, that is just, it's, it's not just like people who know Bilbo's stories might be thinking of that, but I mean, he lives in the hill. Anyone in Hobbiton would know that like mis the mister who lives under the hill is Mr. Baggins, right? Um, so it's 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 like in Shire circles. It would be like a, a like like an open secret in a sense, right? Um, 
simple and easy to remember and kind of an inside joke. Lady Shmabiwak. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, no, Man of Rohan, I don't think he's choosing a, a, a Staddle name in particular. It's just that it's such a common name that, that there are some people in Staddle who also share it. Um, uh, many names, remember, uh, we will be told, um, are shared between the Shire and Bree not by no means all. Um, but there are many shy, there are many surnames that are used in Bree, which are also used in the Shire. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, Matt points out that the, the name is also what he is now certainly not. He's no longer the master of Bag End. Um, right, right. Uh, uh, no, I mean, there's, there is a kind of, uh, there is a kind of, a kind of irony there, right? Um, yeah, but there are other ironies as well. Um, uh, it is true, Fourth Dauntless, um, Brie is also on a hill. In fact, the word Brie means hill. That's what it means. Um, so it's kind of interesting, actually, uh, that... Uh, and, you know, Karita was thinking of the sort of dark and more recent, uh, more recently obtained irony. Uh, Barrow Downs are also hills, right? And he was very recently Mr. Underhill in a very unpleasant and literal sense uh, in that he almost took up permanent residence under a quite different hill, right? Uh, which is, uh, which is interesting, <laughs> right? Obviously Gandalf doesn't didn't foresee that and wasn't referring to that. Uh, but, um, and of course, as Erokeb says, don't forget Tom's house up, down, under hill. Yeah. The use of that phrase there about Tom Bombadil's house. Um, and I don't know quite what to make of it. All of these under hills that we get right under the hill where Bag End is. And then, Tom's house up, down, underhill, and then Carita, as you point out, uh, being inside a barrow, right, and uh, uh, almost buried alive, well, semi-alive, undead, under the hill. Um, uh, and then, of course, we're in Bree, which is hill, right, which means hill. Um, and uh, we've got, like, the underhills who live under the hill there in Staddle, right? Just on the other side of the hill. Uh, uh, under is in the sense of at the foot of the hill. Um, so, um, yeah, anyway. Uh, and then, it, yeah, both Matt and JJ are thinking of parallels with, uh, 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 with Gollum liking to be under hills and at the roots of mountains and things. Um, yeah, yeah. So, I don't know. I don't know what to do with this. We're at the stage where I'm ready to say, kind of looking like there's a pattern here, doesn't there? Right? We have all these hills. Um, but I'm not sure what to do with it yet. And one of the important things, and I know this is extremely difficult in this class in particular. One of the downsides of going as slowly as we go in this class is it's so hard to be patient, right? Because you can't draw safe conclusions until you get, uh, uh, until you get the, the big picture, right? Until you see the, you know, so like for instance, in The Hobbit, um, the fact that Bilbo is from the hill and going to the mountain Right. Um, the whole there and back again journey about how his he's setting out on the quest for the lonely mountain. Right. But of course, this journey is there and back again. So the real destination of his quest is not the mountain. It's the hill. Right. It's the return home. That's ultimately the end. That whole pattern, right, of hill and mountain and, and the relationship between the two of them and how they play off each other, that pattern doesn't really come clear until much later in the book. In fact, the moment that for me really kind of crystallizes it is the moment in chapter 11 when Bilbo is sitting on the doorstep on the mountain looking back towards the hill, right? And that that sense, you know, that, that you know, when Bilbo, thinking back to Bilbo sitting on his own doorstep, right, smoking, in chapter one, the sort of the parallel of these two scenes and the way that that moment 
in Bilbo's own reflections, especially as he's thinking of Gandalf coming along as Gandalf came along back in chapter one, the way that that scene kind of forces us to kind of juxtapose the hill and the mountain against each other like that really kind of makes the whole hill mountain thing really finally sort of come into, uh, uh, come into focus at that point. Right. Um, and so one of the things that I'm going to be continuously doing here is pushing it off, right? Saying let's let's keep let's keep gathering data, and this is one that I really want to keep gathering data on because we have many more hills yet to climb, right? And many more hills yet to come under, uh, and the idea of Frodo being Mister Underhill and that being there being some significance to Mr. Underhill. I don't think we're going to feel the whole significance of it yet for some time. Um, so I have that, I don't know, instinct, which tells me it's not time to draw a conclusion about that yet. So I'm going to not draw a conclusion about that. But I, the, what I will say, again, we can see the pattern, um, but we can already see that the pattern points in a couple different ways at once. Right. Some of the hills under which Frodo is or under which Frodo gets are dangerous, bad places. Right. Like the Barrow Downs. Right. Some of them are good places like Bag End and the House of Tom Bombadil. Right. Up, down, underhill. Remember how much time we spent wrestling with that phrase? Right. How strange that sounds, how oddly that comes across. It sounds like a formula. Right. Um, and. I'm not sure in the end if it's may not merely to introduce the phrase underhill without having a, a, an article in between, right? Without saying under the hill. Um, just having the phrase underhill in the prose, right? There it is. Up, down, underhill. Um, it may well be. We couldn't come up with a good rationale or good explanation of it before. It may well be. That's why. Right. Uh, it certainly is very noticeable that that is one of the only places where we get that phrase literally and exactly uh, in that same way. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, OK, cool. Um, see, but mad violinist, I'm not well. You're right in a sense that the name Underhill stops having any significance after chapter 10 in the sense that Frodo will no longer be referred to as Mr. Underhill. It's not going to be a feature of the plot anymore, but I'm not at all sure that that means that we should forget about it or that it's irrelevant. Um, anyway, yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Um, Kimber, that's a great observation. Kimber says that he likes the way that uh, Tolkien's imagery emphasizes that Bree both feels welcoming and menacing. Kimber, this is one of the things I was really noticing about Bree too, that, that kind of um, two dimensional element of Bree, right? Um, both welcoming and, and menacing, both open and closed, both big and little, right? We see um, uh, we see both of these things about Bree. So Kimber was saying, uh, there, are, there are the twinkling lights in the dark, but also the looming dark outline of the hill itself. Um, and so uh, Kimber was saying that we can see this sort of reflecting the dialogue of the hobbits, both the hoping that it will be homelike, but of course, as Karita points out, only just homelike enough, right? Not, not the same as home by any means. Um, yeah, the lights twinkling some distance ahead is comforting, right? That's a promising sight. But then, Kimber, as you say, before them rose Bree Hill barring the way, a dark mass against misty stars. It's a little more ominous. It's a little more scary, right? Not quite like the, like you get the sense this hill is bigger than most of the hills at home, right? Probably significantly bigger than the hill on which Bag End uh, is, uh, is built. Um, and uh, yeah, good. Eric, I agree that the fact that uh, 
uh, the, the village is nestled under the western flank of the hill seems like a good sign after the Barrow Downs. Right now, that was a Barrow Downs thing. It's not like it's always true of everything, that you should never be on the eastern side of a hill anywhere. But but I agree. Having just come from the Barrow Downs, it's a little reassuring that the uh, uh, that the village seems to be built on the on the on the west side of a hill. Uh, towards it, they now hurried, desiring only to find a fire and a door between them and the night. You ready? Chapter nine. Woohoo! And now we modulate into tourist guide voice, right? Bree was the chief village of the Bree land, a small inhabited region, like an island in the empty lands round about. Besides Bree itself, there was Staddle on the other side of the hill, Coom in a deep valley a little further eastward, and Archet on the edge of the Chetwood. Lying round Bree Hill and the villages was a small country of fields and tamed woodland only a few miles broad. The men of Bree were brown-haired, broad and rather short, cheerful and independent. They belonged to nobody but themselves, but they were more friendly and familiar with hobbits, dwarves, elves, and other inhabitants of the world about them than was, or is, usual with big people. According to their own tales, they were the original inhabitants and were descended from of the first and were the descendants of the first men that ever wandered into the west of the Middle World. Few had survived the turmoils of the elder days, but when the kings returned again over the great sea, they had found the Bree men still there, and they were still there now, when the memory of the old kings had faded into the grass. Okay. Um, first paragraph first. The description. Like an island in the empty lands round about, the first thing that's emphasized about Bree is that it is the chief village of the Bree land, right? But lest we think of this as like a, a wide and spacious, cultivated, friendly countryside that they're entering into, right? We have it emphasized as an island in the empty lands round about. This place is primarily wilderness, right? Primarily wilderness, unsettled, uh, untamed, dangerous land, right? But Bree, the land around Bree Hill for just a few miles, right, is like an island of civilization here in the middle of the wild, right? Um... And we get the names of the villages, Bree, Staddle, Combe, and Archit, right, on the edge of the Chetwood. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, well, no, for Thomas, I don't think he's calling the Shire the empty land about Bree land, right? Remember, there's quite a bit of land uh, that they've skipped along the way. It would have been, I mean, it's a day's journey. Um, so there are many miles of empty land between Buckland and Bree. Um, well, empty south of the road is not empty, right? But it's not empty in a very uh, exciting kind of way, right? It's full of old forest and barrow downs and Tom Bombadil. Uh, plenty full of Tom Bombadil. Uh, but still empty lands from a civilization standpoint, right? Um uh, yeah, so a, a day's journey. That's still that's still a bunch of miles, right, from the uh, uh, from from the river uh, to to Bree. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Kyle, come back to your point about Bree culture, which I agree with you is extremely interesting. Um, Lying round Bree Hill in the villages, a small country of fields and tamed woodland only a few miles broad. Right Now again, to say that the rest of the land is empty, I, I mean, what empty of what, right? Um, what he, empty, as applied to lands, seems to mean here is empty of settled, like, it's not big farmland. Right. You're not going to be it's it's not going to if you're walking through it, it's not going to seem like you're in the middle of civil, civilization. It's going to feel like the wilderness. Right. Is what that uh, what that means. Um, and but, Tony, you're right. It's it's a day's journey uh, from the Brandywine Bridge. 
but it's a long ways, right? Several weeks journey uh, to Rivendell and the mountains. So Bree is much closer to the Shire. Um, and the contrast, I think, between, you know, when he's talking about the Empty Lands, the contrast is to the Shire, I believe, right? When you're crossing the Shire, you're in settled country, right? Um, you're going to, you're, you can go tramping across country, right? Like Frodo did, like uh, Frodo did with his friends, like he and Bilbo used to do. Um, but still, you're aware of the fact that you're, you know, there's going to be settlements and villages and things all over the place. That's not what you're going to find in Bree. In Bree, you have this cluster of villages. So again, sort of both things at once. On the one hand, friendly, little cluster of villages, right? But at the same time, it's like a cluster of little villages standing with their backs against the hill, right? Facing outwards on the wilderness, you know, outwards to, to, to the wilderness uh, that surrounds them, right? Um, yeah. No, Bricktails, I don't think there's any reason to think that the people of Bree know about Rivendell. Um, I don't, I can't imagine that Rivendell is on their, is in their worldview. Um, have they ever heard of it? I mean, maybe, maybe there are stories about that kind of thing, but I can't imagine there are too many people in Bree that even take stories like that seriously. Um, uh, so no, I mean, which means as far as they're concerned, what else is there? Right. I mean, to the East from them. There's no point of, there's no map point, right? Um, if you're at the South Gate of Bree, going to continue down on the East Road, um, what would the sign, like, you know, if you're going to make a, a, a finger post, right, what would it point to? Would they say, you know, what the Forsaken Inn, perhaps, right? But after the Forsaken Inn, Weathertop? There's nothing on Weathertop, right? It's not a place people go. What? <laughs> right? What would they point to? I have to say, you know, destination, X number of miles, right? What, what even would they put on that sign? I don't even know, right? I don't even know. Now, Tony is pointing out that they have met elves, right? They're more familiar with hobbits, dwarves, and elves than others are. So maybe they would have heard of Rivendell. Maybe, but Rivendell's a little secret, right? I mean, it's, it's location at least is secret. Um, would the elves even talk about it? I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe they'd tell stories, but, um, uh, but I'm not sure that the elves would be talking about, I don't think an elf would come in and say, hi, I'm from Rivendell. Like, I, I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe, but, I don't, I don't think so. Um, or at least I'd be a little bit surprised if they did. Um, again, Gorfindel does that when they meet him, but it's different, right? Because he's talking to Strider and he's talking to Frodo, whom he knows is trying to get to Rivendell. Yeah, Zed, it does kind of seem like Misty Mountains, uh, the, the Misty Mountains would be the only landmark, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Oh, Tony, what a great question. Okay, Tony, I have a funny story about, well, not a, it's not very funny, but I have a story about this. Um, so Tony is asking about the capitalization of race names, hobbits, dwarves, elves, but they're not always capitalized. Um, I, my story about this is that I wrestled, not literally, I figuratively wrestled. This is one of the things that I figuratively wrestled with the Houghton Mifflin proofreaders about with my exploring the Lord of the, uh, the Hobbit's book. Um, so when I was doing the exploring the Hobbit, uh, I sometimes capitalized elves and I sometimes didn't capitalize elves and they hated that. 
they they were like it should be is it capitalized or not capitalized and i had to get into all these and and tony had to get into this whole discussion i'm like well tolkien sometimes capitalizes it and sometimes doesn't and so their response was like okay so tolkien didn't have a rule let's set a rule so that we at least can be consistent even if tolkien isn't consistent and i'm like nah it's not that tolkien just was arbitrary about it it's just that he had a particular uh he i i i I believe there is a pattern that you can really uh um, that that you can really uh, uh, you can see a pattern, but it's not necessarily obvious. Um, and the answer, I think, is that basically, I mean, it's like a, it's very simply, it's proper noun or common noun. You can use them as either one, right? If you are referring to hobbits, right, uh, like there were four hobbits walking down the road, that's a lowercase h. You wouldn't capitalize that usually, right? Um, there were four hobbits walking down the road, or Take me to see elves, sir. Right. Lowercase, right? Elves, sir. Um, But when you say, uh, when you're talking in this way, familiar with hobbits, dwarves, elves, and other inhabitants, right? Um, He's using those terms as proper nouns to talk about the people, right? Hobbits as a people, dwarves as a people, elves as a people, right? Um, so when he, when, uh, uh, when he w- would, like in The Hobbit, for instance, when he would say something like, I think it's at the beginning of a sentence, so it doesn't really help, but when he says, like, elves are uh, and remain good people, proper noun, right? It's referring to the race as a whole, right? But um, when he says the raftmen of the elves, he means lowercase e. It's just, he's just using it as a common noun. Right. Um, anyway, so that's the rule, and it's he's applying that rule here, right? Hobbits, dwarves, elves, proper names for the people as a whole. Um, but yeah, boy, proofreaders hate that action. <laughs> but it's, you know, there it is. What can I say? Um, yeah, yeah. Anyway, okay. But gosh, you know, now that I am, uh, um, now that I'm sorry, ever since I asked that finger post question, it's been running through my head and I've been realizing something I never even realized before. Cause you get so used to the Wilderland map, right? With the last homely house and everything else. There's nothing. I mean, from a Breland perspective, there's nothing prior to the lonely mountain. I mean, maybe by now Erebor counts Erebor and Dale are sufficiently civilized I mean they pro- might not even have heard may it might have heard of them because dwarves still travel through so maybe they've they've heard of of Dale and the Lonely Mountain by now you know some 77 years after the fact you know after the reestablishment um JJ I mean it's hard the lands of the Bjornings maybe but that's a little vaguer, right? Um, they're like, there's no city, for instance, right? Um, so, yeah, it's just interesting to think about. I, I kind of, I've never really asked myself that question before, kind of putting myself from a Brie perspective and thinking about what, there's a road that goes out to the east. Where does it go? <laughs> What's the point of it? Right. Why does anybody go that way? Um, And, you know, dwarves, because dwarves are kind of unaccountable. Who knows where they're going? Um, But. uh, But I think that this is actually a really interesting. um, This really connects interestingly with some of this. We'll come back to this when we talk about the cross. When we talk about the roads. Right. And Bree as a crossroads. Um, anyway, yeah, we'll come back to that. Okay. So small country of fields and tamed woodland. So we've got Bria as Bri an island in the empty lands, right? So it is not the Shire. Shire, large cultivated land, large tamed land from one border to the next. Up in the north farthing, things can be a little... A little uh, 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 adventurous, right? Maybe there's a giant walking around up there. Maybe there isn't, but you know, it's possible up in the north farthing. 
but most of the Shire is uh, settled country. Bree, not so. Okay, now to the description of the Bree Landers and of Bree culture. And Kyle, back to the observation that you made a while back, right? Um, it is interesting how long the Bree Landers survive, right? How long their culture survives. And as Kyle was emphasizing, it's not just that it's so interesting that they're still in the same place after so long. I mean, that is interesting all by itself. Um, but that they never fell, right? Um, I mean, think about it. Two Numenorean societies have risen and fallen s since uh, after Bree was established. So we're, t we're, it's, we're told that Bree was established when men first came into the West. So presumably the elf friends, right, the three kindred of men who crossed the Blue Mountains and entered Beleriand and came, became part of the, you know, became the elf friends and the, uh, the forefathers of the Numenorians uh, in the first stage. Like the Breelanders were like in that same migration, but they stopped at Bree, right? So the rest of them, people of Marach and the, you know, the people of Haleth and they all, they, you know, Beor and his family, they all cross the mountains, right? And keep going. The Breelanders stay. So they do their thing, like most of the first age of the sun, right, happens in the war with Morgoth and then the breaking of Beleriand and the establishment of Numenor and Bree is already there, right, long before any of that stuff happens. So, you know, Gondolin has not fallen, Doriath has not fallen, Nargothrond has not fallen, um, uh, Fingolfin has not yet fought his duel with Morgoth and Bree is established already, is what is being suggested, Right. And so the whole thing, the whole story, you know, the vast majority of the story of Beleriand in the first age happens. The founding of Numenor, the long rise and fall of the Numenorean Empire in the second age, right? All happens. And there's Bree, still there, right? Still the same. And then the kings returned again over the Great Sea, and they find the Bree men still there. Right, so we get Elendil comes back and sets up his new kingdom in Arnor, now quite close to Bree, right? Uh, quite close to Bree. Fornost is just up to the north of here, right? Which was the second capital, as we know, of Arnor. Uh, so the new kingdom of the Numenorians, geographically quite close to Bree, and yet Bree remains and uh, still stands, right? But again, the point that Kyle made that I, I agree is really interesting is not that it was never conquered, right? It's that it never fell. I mean, internally fell. Again, two Numenorean societies rose and fell, right? Fell into darkness, fell into evil. Um, and Bree never did, right? It never grew and it never fell. It never expanded. It never became a kingdom. It's still, it's been around for how many thousands of years? And it's still an island in the empty lands, right? The lands about them have been empty for how long? Right now, it's not to say that the description currently is, is um, the way it's always been at all times, right? That the land around them has always been as empty as it is right now. Um, like it was close enough that, and the whole, I mean, think of Carlin, right? Carlin is right there in the Barrow Downs. Like, they were on the very edge. The border between Carlin and Arthodyne is right there, on, you know, outside the town. It's, you know, a short pony jaunt, right, as darkness is falling, uh, you know, from, from Bree. So, obviously, Bree is located, like, near the epicenter of the... Um, near near the epicenter of the whole Arnorian civil war, right? So there's no way that the land around it was always really empty. We know that that can't have been true. Um, and yet, uh, they, there's no evidence that they themselves ever altered, right? Um, and Tilly and I agree, it is interesting that it matches 
Tom Bombadil, right? In a sense, that Bree has, you know, Bree, like Tom, has been there, you know, functionally forever uh, and has seen things around it come and go and rise and fall and it remains the same, right? There is something kind of Tom Bombadilian about Bree in that way. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, but I agree, Emma Thorne. I think that um, the Brelanders do seem to be content as to why they never grew into an empire or fell into darkness. Um, that seems to have as much to do with their humility as anything else, right? Like they're a humble village. Have always been have been a humble village for seven thousand years or something like that. Um uh yeah, yeah. Um JJ, we have no idea if they participated in the wars at all. Were they aligned with Arnor? What did they do during the civil wars? It's hard to imagine that the people of Bree could have managed to remain completely independent during the civil wars. Again, they're like right there in the middle. Um, where where at least we know two of the kingdoms joined right there, and the third one is not far away. Um, yeah, Bricktails, they are an extremely strategic, like the, the crossroad. It's a, now, it's not quite a strategic Bree Hill wouldn't be as tactically significant as something like Weathertop and Amonsul and with its, you know, Palantir, right? So uh, Amonsul is the place that they were all actually fighting over. Uh, and so compared to Amonsul, uh, Bree is just a backwater, right? I mean, who cares about the little hill with the little village on it when you've got the huge hill with the mighty tower with the Palantir in it, right? So it's obviously a big, uh, a big difference. But... Um, but yeah, I do think that um, uh, Tony, as you say, the humility, their humility protects them from the temptation of evil, uh, like the hobbits. There does seem to be a, a kind of uh, um, a kind of likeness between the Brelanders and their outlook on life, uh, and the hobbits and their outlook uh, uh, on life. Um, yeah. That does seem to be the um, um, the main thing, and yeah, for thoughtless, I'm aware of that. As I was saying, like the little village on its small hill isn't all that important. For thoughtless, I was also remembering other hills, which when you go, uh, for thoughtless is specifically recalling Gettysburg and uh, why Gettysburg, the Battle of Gettysburg, was fought there because it was at a crossroads and the hill. I mean, uh, for thoughtless, I remember the first time I saw the hill. Um, that uh, um, uh, that uh, what's his name Pickett charged up right and I'm like seriously it's barely an incline right I mean, it's like you know there are hills I'm like you know uh, Little Round Top is not huge but it's at least steep right uh, but yeah it's like a kind of a slope right um, but uh, any so I, I I was actually thinking of the same thing when uh, uh, while I was saying that. But still, again, compared to Amonsul, Amonsul obviously much much more important. Um, but um, yeah, yeah. Um, Aruran, I agree. It is really fascinating that we don't get any further history of Bree. Of course, as several of you have pointed out, most of the stuff that we get, the background and the history that we're getting in this is, is according to their own tales, right? According to their own tales, they were the original inhabitants. Is that really true? I forgot who was it who asked, but somebody was asking just earlier, like, what? Well, I wonder what story Tom Bombadil would say about that. Maybe they're wrong, right? Maybe that's what their legends say. Maybe the Brelanders haven't actually been there for, you know, uh, very long at all, and they just think they have. Um, perhaps. Uh, I, I, I don't see any reason to believe that, but it's, of course, conceivable that that is the case. But anyway, Aruran, I agree with you. It is really interesting that Tolkien never gives us any more, right? We don't know. And the details on the Arnorian Civil War are pretty sketchy, right? We don't get all that much uh, told in the appendices. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, and for Thoughtless, we're going to look around Bree 
tonight in game to see what the what the because of course uh when creating the visual uh landscape around Bree uh within the Lord of the Rings online uh the makers of the game couldn't remain neutral on these things right Tolkien can just not tell us this stuff uh but when in the game they're actually depicting it they had to they had to make some decisions right uh and so we're we're going to look at some of those decisions uh tonight um yeah yeah um good good um Hey, I know. Let's keep going. In those days, no other men had settled dwellings so far west or within a hundred leagues of the Shire. But in the wild lands beyond Bree, there were mysterious wanderers. The Bree folk called them rangers and knew nothing of their origin. They were taller and darker than the men of Bree and were believed to have strange powers of sight and hearing and to understand the languages of beasts and birds. They roamed at will southwards and eastwards even as far as the Misty Mountains, but they were now few and rarely seen. When they appeared, they brought news from afar and told strange forgotten tales which were eagerly listened to, but the Bree folk did not make friends of them. <laughs> Man of Rohan added, and they occasionally had, had wore wooden shoes. Right? Oh, only special ones wore wooden shoes. There were also many families of hobbits in the Breeland. They claimed to be the oldest settlement of hobbits in the world, one that was founded long before even the Brandywine was crossed and the Shire colonized. They lived mostly in Staddle, though there were some in Bree itself, especially on the higher slopes of the hill, above the houses of the men. The big folk and the little folk, as they called one another, were on friendly terms, minding their own affairs in their own ways, but both rightly regarding themselves as necessary parts of the Bree folk. Nowhere else in the world was this peculiar but excellent arrangement to be found. Um, yeah, good. Um, let's start with the rangers in the first paragraph. Um, by the way, I've titled this slide East and West because um, this, of course, picks up exactly on Butterbur's. You can see here where Butterbur's language comes from, right? When he says there's no accounting for East, or, for East and West, as we say. And by that, he means the Shire Folk and the Rangers, because those are the only two cultural uh, uh, like reference points that they have in Bree, right? There's the Shire Hobbits, and there's the Rangers. Uh, the Shire Hobbits, very distinctly to the west, right, in a, a known land, though one that the Brelanders don't often visit. And there's much more vaguely the Rangers wandering around in the land to the east. That's clearly what signs near Bree would say, right? They wouldn't point to anything in particular out to the east. They'd just be like, Rangers, this way, right? Here there be rangers, is what is where is what the maps would say, um, uh, and rangers clearly means something like uh, gypsies, right? Um, wandering folk, homeless folk who wander about, not like individual. I mean, I know that when I hear them talking about uh, uh, they roamed at will southwards and eastwards even as far as the Misty Mountains I have in my head Aragorn. Well, I'm picturing Aragorn. So I'm picturing like, you know, dozens of Aragorns wandering about on individual quests, right? Uh, but they uh, they're, they're, they think of them as uh, uh people right there were mysterious wanderers and i don't think it's necessarily just isolated rangers on quests as if i mean they would be of course they would, everybody knows they would be sitting by campfires rather than wandering about um but uh but they they're travelers right people without settled homes so and the tone 
of Ranger, right? From uh, the the scornful tone. Scornful is Aragorn's word, right? Uh, uh, when he talks about the, the nickname Strider that he's been given, he calls it a scornful name. Um, Ranger is clearly a scornful nickname. Even, um, even Frodo's own confession, right? Confession of his um, misunderstanding when he t- meets Gandalf again in Rivendell, and he says that he had no idea that Strider was one of the old kings. He says, I thought he was only a ranger, right? Only a ranger in Frodo's vocabulary there, which, again, he's p- picked up from Bree, certainly suggests that ranger means class of not very civilized people, right? Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, and yeah, and here, uh, Brandon, I exactly also always had that problem too, um, that because Dungeons and Dragons took the name Ranger, right, and applied it to a character class, which is modeled after Aragorn in the Lord of the Rings, um, that also, like, you know, rangers, right? Oh, well, I know rangers, right? There are rangers that live here and there are paladins that live over there, right? Um, so, I mean, again, that, that I think that really helped when I was a kid to sort of cement in my imagination, like, what this meant. Um, I never pictured families. Like, the, there have to be women and children, too, right? Uh, there have to be, like, family units, but they don't have a village. Um, from a Bree land perspective, they... Uh, uh, they, the rangers, are weird, right? They're weird because they don't live, you know, the, think about how the Brelanders all cluster together, right? In their one little pocket of of civilized land in the midst of the empty lands. And here the rangers live in the empty lands, right? They just wander around without a village at all, right? No town. Um, they just they just roam about. Do they have wagons? I don't know if they have wagons, right? Um, you know, if, they, if, if, if they're understood to be traveling... Um, uh, you know, about in that way, I don't know. Um, but, um, uh, but anyway, that, that, that seems to be, um, um, that seems to be what the Brelanders mean, um, but, and why they're scornful of it. Like they're vagabonds, right? Um, and that's what they, and that's why the word ranger, to, again, it's so hard to divest the word ranger of all of its later accretions, right? And to try to hear it as Butterbur means it when he says it in Brie, right? But this paragraph gives us the clearest vision of that, right? And I want to, I want to make sure that we really catch that. Um, mysterious, or they're not just vagabonds. They don't just look at them, at, look down on them as low class, Right. As tramps. Tramp, I think, is not a synonym for ranger, not a direct synonym anyway. Right. Um, Because they're mysterious wanderers. Right. Um, And they know nothing of their origin. Mysterious again. Right. Doubly their origin. Their history is mysterious. Their the way that they live and why they live the way that they live is also mysterious. Right. Um, They're different. They're taller and darker than the men of Bree, right? So they, 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 they're from different stock than the Brelanders, clearly. They're from out of town. Um, and they're believed to have strange powers of sight and hearing and to understand the languages of beasts and birds. And that's not a good thing, right? That makes them fishy and weird, like mysterious again, right? And but spooky now and potentially uncanny and probably untrustworthy, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Eric Hebb says, I can imagine brief folk, brief folk stories featuring, you know, rangers with kind of, uh, uh, you know, unaccountable powers that can help or hinder the protagonist of the story, depending on their mood. Sure. Yeah. I I would imagine the same kind of thing. Um, yeah, yeah. 
Um, well, Tony, you have to be careful about the Rangers of Athelion, right? Because by the time Fr Frodo, by the time Frodo gets to Athelion, his definition of Ranger is totally changed, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Amethorn and they're secretive, right? Exactly, exactly. Um, Fourth Dauntless says, so the Brelanders think of rangers as fairies. You know, there's something like, I, I this description, doesn't this description sound a little fairy-like, right? Um, mysterious wanderers, understanding the languages of beast and with magical powers, right? Um, wandering through the wild country for undisclosed reasons, doing undisclosed things, right? Yeah. Um, oh, and I agree, Tony, the fact that it, it is not at all obvious that they can understand the language of beasts and birds. I, I think that if we, we can't rashly conclude from this, that that's obviously a power that the Dunedain have, right? We can't be sure about that. All that we know is that the people of Bree believe that they can, right? Um, now, maybe they can, maybe they can't, maybe some of them can, uh, but, um, uh, and yeah, uh, Tony, remembering Bard and the people of Dale and the line of Girion who can understand the thrushes uh, should come back to us here. But um, yeah, yeah. Um, now, uh, uh, Sikaya, that's a really interesting point. And I've been avoiding that word, but I'll not avoid it. Um, Sakai says it, it, it's it's almost like accusing someone of of witchcraft. Um, that I, I I've been avoiding that, and the reason I've been avoiding that is that I don't. Uh, strange, mysterious people who have strange and mysterious powers, and believing that they are therefore quite likely in touch with dark powers and to be feared as servants of evil um, that's kind of Christian kind of post like post Christian era like after the Christian era um, I'm not saying it's uniquely it's a uniquely Christian folk belief but it is a characteristically Christian folk belief. Um, and I'm not sure that it would necessarily be relevant. That is because, and when I say that it's Christian, what I mean is, so um, if you're a, a Christian peasant in, say, the 17th century, and there's somebody living out in the wild, and you believe they have strange powers, well, where did they get those powers from? Right. Uh, if you're a Christian, there's a short list of places from which you could get powers. Right. Uh, if you if you have strange powers of sight and hearing and understand the languages of beasts and birds, you can either be inspired by God or you can be inspired by demons. Right. Um, and the latter is frankly more likely, especially if you're shady in other ways. Right. So. Uh, in. uh in a difference in a pre-Christian society, the idea that people who are in touch with strange powers would would you know the, the, that you would assume that they would be powers of darkness that they would be in touch with is a less obvious kind of assumption, if you see what I mean. That's why I've been kind of avoiding that because it's a natural kind of thing to say, but I don't think it necessarily applies. Um, you see what I mean by that? Um, yeah. Now, I, I, I agree, um, Mad Violinist. It, there are other things, right? Fairies were a classic example, not just in Irish culture, but in many cultures, of 
this sort of third category, right? Something which is not exactly, doesn't look like a demon, but isn't probably from God either, and we're not quite sure how to fit it into the worldview. Um, that's, uh, I, agreed. I, I'm not saying that everything is simply binary in that way. I'm just saying that that kind of fear, like the, that you would go straight from one, I suspect that this person has strange and supernatural powers, and two, I assume that that person most likely is getting them from demons or from agents of darkness. That's, uh, that's, that assumption, uh, is an assumption that's kind of easier from within a Christian framework than from within a pre-Christian framework. Um, but uh, sorry, I didn't see your name there on Twitter. Uh, your question about the language there, there's, it's interesting here that there's no indication that the Rangers speak any other language. I, they do clearly, right? Um, I'm sure they, they clearly retain, you know, still speak Elvish among themselves. Is that their native tongue or do they like, in private? Is that what they speak? We don't really know for sure. They obviously know it and learn it. Um, but, uh, but do they speak a different language from the men of Bree? Nothing is said about that. So I would assume that when the Bree landers interact with the Rangers, they're always interacting with them in the tongue of in in the in in the common speech, which the Brelanders speak. Um, so, uh, I, because again, nothing here is emphasized about them speaking a strange language, and you know that Tolkien would have emphasized that if that had been an issue for the Brelanders, right? Um, yeah. Um, Karina is still confused as to why talking to animals would be scary or bad since talking to animals is obviously awesome. I hear you. Um, it's scary if others can do it and you can't, <laughs> right? And perhaps, uh, you know, you might be envious, right? But I, I agree. It's totally awesome, right? Um, and yet um, it's, it's, if you can't do it, it's uncanny, Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Good. Um, when they appeared, they brought news from afar and told strange forgotten tales, which were eagerly listened to. But the Bree folk did not make friends of them. Um, that last one is one of the most interesting things to me that they bring news from afar and tell strange forgotten tales, right? Telling strange forgotten tales, not that shocking, right? But uh, um, bringing news from afar is really interesting, right? Um, the rangers are in touch with the wider world. That's one of the ways in which the rangers fit into the worldview of the Brelanders, right? In being in contact with the rangers, they're not just, like, occasionally interacting with a strange isolationist people who live off on their own, right? I saw somebody comparing the rangers to the Amish or something, or uh, which is interesting, right? But in this way, this sentence really suggests that it's almost the opposite of that, right? Instead of seeing the... And that's what I find so interesting about it, right? You might think that, the, okay, you know, you're, you're this separate, weird kind of culture out there. And again, the East and West thing almost suggests that, right? We've got the hobbits over here, we've got the rangers over here, and here we are in the middle, right? Um, is what East and West, uh, as, a, as an expression, you know, there's no accounting for East and West, as Butterbur says it, uh, seems to me to kind of imply... But the rangers would seem to be associated in, in Bree culture with something very close to the opposite of something like the Amish culture, right? Not just people who keep to themselves and mind themselves and don't trouble themselves with the affairs of the outside world, right? The opposite, in fact. They are always traveling around. They are in, not just that they themselves have a wide experience and that they travel all over the place like the Bree landers don't, but also that they interact with people in strange and foreign lands and bring news of those foreign lands, bring news from afar to Brie, right? That they are seen to be a kind of bridge between Brie and the outside world, right? And that this is true geographically, but it's also true chronologically, 
as well, that they bring Bree into contact with the ancient world with uh, uh, from which they, the Bree lenders, are otherwise cut off, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, are there female rangers, Veronica? An excellent, qu- I mean, yes, in that we know they reproduce, right? But do the Brelanders ever interact with them? We don't know. We don't know. Uh, is there anything in this paragraph that suggests that it's only men that they interact with? I don't see that there is. Um, yeah, among the agreed. They're clearly female Dunedain, but are there female rangers in the Bree sense? Um uh, that is to say, like the strange wanderers that they meet, are they occasion? Are they sometimes male and sometimes female, or is it only wandering males that they interact with? I don't think we get any data on that. So, uh, um, yeah, I, I don't know, I don't know. So. Yeah, I don't. I I don't know. What I'm trying to judge here, I'm try. I'm thinking about the framework of this passage, and the framework of this passage is, this is telling us the culture of the Brelanders, right? And based on how they describe the rangers, does it seem safer to assume that the Brelanders only interact with masculine wanderers, or do they, or are the wanderers that they interact with might be both either male or female? Again, several of you, uh, of you guys in the comments are trying to answer a completely different question, which is based upon what we know of the Dunedain, how often did the women travel? It's a similar kind of question, right? It seems to be asking the same question in different words, but it's a completely different framework uh, than the one I'm thinking of, right? Um, the one I'm, th- again, from the Bree land perspective, based on what the Bree landers say, what reason, do we have any reason to believe? Does it seem likelier that they were all men or all women that the Bree landers interact with? Do you see what I mean? Forget the appendices. The appendices don't tell us anything about the Breland perspective. Forget about the appendices. Appendices are relevant. Think only of this passage and what is said in Bree about the rangers. Would they mention female rangers as a strange thing? Ambrosius Aureliana, see, that's what I'm trying to decide. I'm trying to decide if I think the Brelanders would find it stranger that women traveled or if they would find it stranger that they never saw any women of the rangers. In which case, there would be... Wouldn't there be? Because they would know that they existed, since, obviously, they reproduced rangers, right? Uh, they stick around generation to generation, so they clearly have women folks somewhere. So wouldn't... If they only interacted with men ever, wouldn't that then suggest that there was some kind of uncertain you know some kind of hidden secret base that nobody knew about even though it was I mean I don't know I'm trying to think what would be stranger what would be more unusual and I question I don't I don't I don't don't challenge but I question the assumption that Tolkien wouldn't have women wandering around. Wouldn't he? Couldn't he? Is that automatic? I don't know.
Yeah, because uh, I'm not even sure that, uh, as I as I said at the beginning, I'm not at all sure that solitary wanderers are what is being described here. In the wildlands beyond Bree, there were mysterious wanderers. The Bree folk called them rangers. They roamed at will, but they were now few and rarely seen. I'm not at all convinced that the interactions that they're having with the rangers are just solitary men. They could be family groups. That seems to me likely, really, based on this. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, but, but Kimber, you're generalizing, uh, Tolkien's best trackers are all men, but Kimber, how many are you thinking of? Two? Aragorn and Beleg? Right? It's a small sample size, right? There are lots of people whose stories are not told, right? Um, I, 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 See, that's I'm, I'm not comfortable from generalizing from data points like that. But again, much more importantly, um, based on the description here, based on the Breland perception of the rangers, the mere fact that they think of the rangers as a culture, the rangers to the east, the shire folk to the west, right? suggests to me that they're not thinking them as just random individuals. No. No. Um. Nah. No. No, okay. Uh, all right. Let me explain what I'm grunting and waving my hands at, because I'm looking at a bunch of comments and I'm waving my hands at a whole bunch of different things. A, I am not interested in what is said about the first age or anything else, right? I'm just not, right? I'm focused on Bree and what we know about what we can what conclusions we can draw about what the Bree landers think of them okay so the only data that i'm really interested in is right here secondly the kinds of conclu like, extrapolating from it from small groups of extraordinary characters the fact that we don't ever see any companies like of the like adventurous companies that are followed in the Fellowship of the Ring and the Hobbit, that there are no women among them. And extrapolating from that, that Tolkien doesn't have women traveling at all seems to me, again, that's a small sample size, right? I am not at all convinced that that is necessarily the case. He's not trying to describe whole cultures here. And what we do get here, from the Brelanders' perspective, is that the rangers are wandering people. They are mysterious wanderers. Um, they roamed at will. They are now few and rarely seen. I am not convinced that these are stray, random, masculine persons that they're meeting necessarily. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm even more leery of using parallels to real world cultures or anything like that, then I, I, in to say, like, based on these other societies, women didn't travel, so they probably don't in Tolkien either. Okay. Uh, but that's not data, right? Um, that's a parallel. I mean, it can be relevant, but it's not data, right? Uh, right now, I'm looking for data. Uh, from the text, and I want to keep looking at how they talk about rangers, because I think that this is an interesting point. Again, notice the whole idea of solitary masculine wanderers. Rangers, is so that's just, that's based on a one, 
data point, right? Because there's one ranger that we meet in the text, and so he is the ranger in our minds, just as he is the ranger in the minds of, you know, Gary Gygax when he when he wrote D and D, right? Um, but yeah, Karita Strider could be. Remember, Frodo and Bilbo are peculiar as bachelors, right? Strider could be peculiar in that he travels alone. That could be unusual. We do, do we do we have any reason to think that that's not unusual, right? We know he does it. Not only do I think we are not justified in taking that as the norm, but I think that we're unwise to take that as the norm, right? He is Strider is nothing if not unusual, right? Um, so, anyway, um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Yeah, Matt, that's exactly what I was thinking. No accounting for East and West is a reference to the people of the Shire and the Rangers. There's nothing in the description of the Shire that ignores the female population. The same can be true of the Rangers. Exactly. I would think that if all they met were solitary males like Aragorn, they wouldn't even think of them as a people. They would think of them as travelers, right? They would think of them as like, you know... um, they wouldn't think of them in that East versus West. The fact that they think of them as East versus West suggests there's a culture of... They think of them as a culture of people, right? In which case, presumably, not just solitary masculine persons. Um, yeah. Lady Shmabiwak Strider may certainly well be the ranger that other rangers think is weird. That, that, that may certainly be true. In fact, that seems to me likely, really... Um, so taking him as the model upon which like that, we can assume that Rangers as a whole follow, I think is unwise. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, can we talk about the relationship with the hobbits? Yes, we can. Yeah. And, and I'm running over time here pretty seriously. Let's talk about that second paragraph and then we'll uh, and then we'll we'll uh, finish our book discussion for the night. Um, Many families of hobbits in the Breland, they claim to be the oldest settlements of hobbit, oldest settlement of hobbits in the world. One that was founded long before even the Brandywine was crossed in the Shire colonized. So what do we get with the hobbits? Right. Um, Hobbits, on the one hand, are more recent. Bree, the men of Bree were here first. Right, the big folk were here for first. The hobbits came later. But when they came, they joined with the Brelanders, and this is the big difference between East and West to some extent, right? Uh, well, not between East and West, that's unfair. Um, but this is the big difference between... So, so we have the Rangers who have come into the area but who have not connected with the Brelanders, who have remained separate, right? Then you have the hobbits who came in and they moved in, Right. Now, some of them moved out again and became weird over in the Shire, but the hobbits have been there forever, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> you guys are still talking about <laughs> rangers. I'm going to, uh, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, not talk about that anymore, though. Um, they live mostly in Staddle, though there were some in Bree. And especially on the higher slopes of the hill above the houses of the men. That I assume, I'm trying to parse that, right? Is there significance to that? Does it say, I mean, that is, does, does, does it tell us something about the sort of class, uh, any kind of class distinction between the big folk and the little folk in Brie, but I don't think so. I think that that is pragmatic, right? Um, or that they got their second, so they go further up the hill, but Mad Violence, I think it's just like, because the Brie Wonders are building above ground, 
right? So you want to build on the lower and more gradual slopes of the hill, whereas when the slope gets steep up at the top, the hobbits can still live inside, right? Since they're delving into the hill, um, you know, a steep hillside is quite congenial, right? Perfect, in fact, for them. Whereas if you're, tr- if you're trying to build a house, uh, an above-ground house, a really steep slope, not the place that you want, right? So um, it seems more like a it seems more like a uh, uh, a um, you know I don't know Jack Spratt and his wife kind of situation right that part part of the hill is perfectly suited for the hobbits part of the hill su- perfectly suited for the big folk and they all lived happily there together as far as I understand that um, uh yeah, I, I, a happy arrangement, uh, an excellent arrangement, right? Um, it's interesting, though, that they mind their own affairs in their own ways, right? They both rightly regard themselves as necessary parts of the brief folk, but they're necessary, but they're still kind of separate parts. Um, they're sort of egalitarian, but they're not exactly mixed in the sense that nobody really pays much attention, right? And they're all, they're all kind of, uh, they don't seem to mix that freely. And I don't mean like intermarriage, which would be awkward. I mean, um, they mind their own affairs, which makes it sound like they have kind of separate subcultures. It's just that those two subcultures, uh, are harmonious, right? Um, That's my understanding of what that means, minding their own affairs in their own ways. So, for instance, there would be, like, different... Com- we don't know anything about the politics of Bree, right? Who's in charge in Bree? Is there a political figure? Is there a master of the town? Is there a, is there a mayor? Is there a governor? Um, uh, I don't uh, see that there is. Right. Um, it seems to be basically anarchic. Right. Like all good societies. in Tolkien. <laughs> That's not true. But anyway, like many good societies in Tolkien, it's anarchical. Um, uh, everybody's minding their own affairs. Right. But the hobbits mind their affairs together and the men mind their own affairs together. Um, and I agree. Minding your own affairs does seem to be uh, uh, a part of reculture, Matt. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, it does seem very Shire like, uh, Ambrosius Aurelianus. I agree. Um, the Shire does have a titular mayor, though that's not exceptionally relevant, right? He doesn't really have any power, exactly. Um, yeah. And Tony, I agree. Butterbird does seem to have some authority in town, right? At least sort of unofficially. Uh, but it's, it, I don't get, I don't see any information about, um, uh, the actual political structure of Bree. But, but as far as the relationship with hobbits, it is interesting to me that although, uh, the coexistence of hobbits and men in Bree is called by the narrator an excellent arrangement, it's not true. It's not truly mixed. The society again. They're parallel. They do mix. Like at the Prancing Pony, there are both hobbits and and men there, right? Uh, so you got big folk and little folk get together and all drink down the pub, and that's an important mixing, right? Certainly a very important social moment. Think of, for instance, the difference between the Ivy Bush and the Green Dragon, right? The Ivy Bush is the place where the old fogies drink, and the Green Dragon is the place where the younger generation <laughs> drinks. That's like all we know about those two pubs, apparently. And it's an extrapolation based upon the fa- you know the location of the different generations of conversation there, but. Um, uh, uh, but anyway, yeah, uh, Lincoln, exactly. They intersect more than they mix, right? There's even a sense, don't you get the sense in the in the common room of the Prancing Pony that the hobbits are sitting together and the men are sitting together, right? It's probably not like big, uh, you know, tables where there are men and hobbits both sitting together and drinking together, right? They're like near each other, but they're 
um, they're not necessarily together. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, go, exactly. Mad Violinist was just exactly was saying exactly the same thing. They sit with their own rather than at mixed tables. Um, yes, yes. Um, yeah, exactly, exactly. And uh, um, yeah, now that's a really interesting point. Val- Valori points out that that might be practical, right? Um, that is you would have need different size chairs and tables for the little folk and the big folk, right? So you'd have to have hobbit sized tables and big people sized tables. So it'd be hard for them to all be sitting around the same table. Um, agreed. Agreed. And it, 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 because I'm not trying to suggest, I mean, you know, I don't want to, um, I think it would be wrong to try to look at this, um, with, uh, to look at the Brie culture and to, to, to suggest that, like, tr- actually, it's like a, a, a divided and divisive culture. And there's this, like, you know, uh, like, submerged racist subculture in Brie with them not mixing with each other and stuff. I'm not trying to suggest anything like that. I just think it's interesting that they, even in Brie, which is the only place where this kind of thing happens, um, we don't see a clear... Uh, a clear mixture in this way. Um, and Lincoln is wondering why. Why don't we get more mixed cultures like this? And that's a great question. Um, like uh, cosmopolitanism is extremely unusual in Middle Earth. Um, that's true. It's very true. Um, The only place that we, where we will see, yeah, oops, sorry. Here, I didn't go. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Narnian logged out because I was just about to switch over to him and then got distracted again. Anyway, yeah, okay. I, 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 we've got to head out. We will consider the question of cosmopolitanism next time. That's a much bigger question than I can tackle right now. Um, but uh okay yeah all right so let's let's end this here after after uh um thinking about uh <laughs> thinking about rangers and hobbits uh for quite a long time let's um uh let's let's end here so we'll end our book discussion here uh, we'll carry on with our contemplation of Bree and our, uh, and maybe we'll even get to Harry at the West Gate next time. Um, and, uh, uh, maybe, but anyway, let's, um, uh, let's, let's head. It's time. It's uh, field trip time. So for those of you who are, uh, on, uh, Twitter or who are just in discord and haven't joined us on Twitch yet, I encourage you to come and join us on Twitch, uh, so that you can join in our field trip for the day. So thanks everybody on Twitter who joined us. I'm going to say goodbye to you there. See you next week. If I can actually, there we go. Very good. Hey, sorry, hello. There you are. Hi, it's, hey, it's Valoria, everybody. I'm on the Scott Yule tonight. Okay. Did you go off flying? Uh, I oops, I did, and I seem to have come back in a different layer. Layer. That's okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, why don't you fill up with me and head on in here? Okay, so sorry. We can head out to where we're going. Uh, which character are you on? Scott Yule. Oh, Scott Yule. Okay. Oops. I must have spelled it wrong. How do you spell it? G O T J U. Ah, G O T, right. Yeah, not G U D, it's G U T. Okay. You always have to get creating with spelling. You know? Yes. Got you. Got it. All right. <laughs> okay. So, so yes, yeah. we're going to go to Bree tonight, so it's not so far. Woo. All right. So, oh, wait, hang on a second. Now I'm going to move you into my fellowship, though, aren't I? Uh, or can I? Let's see. Maybe. I think if you hit layer, not me. 
No. Oh shoot! No, it has to be you. It, yeah, I've got to. I've got to. I've got to. I'm gonna. I'm gonna transfer leadership, leadership. to you. Yeah. Okay. okay. No, I'm gonna do it. Okay. Yes. All right. Got it. Okay. Any moment, folks. So uh, like you're feeling better. Yeah, me too. That was awful. <laughs> so yeah, but the minute you talked about everybody sitting at segregated tables, I immediately thought of uh going to my kids school on parent night <laughs> yes behind those chairs i, I remember because my my daughter's in fifth grade this year and this is the first time we showed up in uh, parents night and the chairs were actually our side and you could just hear the round of sighs of relief from oh all my the goodness yeah we saw the size of the chairs we wouldn't have to sit with our, our knees up to our chins absolutely so, there yeah. might be some crossover at the tables but it has to be pretty awkward on either side yes Yes, you would think uh, that that would be a major part of the table thing. And you're so right about uh, Parents' Night. Okay, um, let's meet up at the crossroads again. Okay. Did you make it over to the lair or what? I did. Uh, I am in your okay. lair now. Okay, cool. But I was already on the way out to uh, the street. Outside. Uh, oh, you thought we'd all left. Gotcha. I switched over, yeah. Okay. Sorry, yeah, I know I just uh, it vanished and then didn't successfully fully return. So that's all right. So let's um, head out to the crossroads. Or crossroads, you... yes. We'll meet at the crossroads Pretty here. So we didn't get to the physical description of Bree, so I don't want to spend too much time looking around the inside uh, of well, of Bree. One of the <clears throat> things that I am most interested in. Uh, by the in-game depiction of Bree mm -hmm. is the hill. Um, or, or rather the uh, sort of non-prominence of the hill. Um, there is a hill, right? I mean, like when you're, sta yeah. when you're standing out yeah. here, you can see a hill. Uh, so if I'm, I'm going to go just to the bridge and turn around, so I'm like looking from this vantage point, right? So when you're looking at the at the town from a distance, okay, there's a tree in the way, but there's a hill over there on the left, mm -hmm. vaguely next to and behind the town. But you would certainly never describe this, looking at it from here, as a town on the slopes of a hill. No, it's it's more like a, a slow, steady grade. Yeah. Or something like that. And the streets um, themselves, I mean, there are some streets that are kind of slopey, you know, inside the inside. Like up to the Prancing Pony is a good one. Right, exactly. There's a little, there's a rise there. And, and then you kind of go, go down the other side of that little, that little rise. But, um, the uh, line's very hilly. yeah, but it's, 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 it's mostly, it's, so it's, you know, one interesting choice, right, is that they've kind of flattened out Brie a little bit. They've made it next to, well, I mean, again, a sort of hill, but it's more of a shelf or step. <laughs> I'm thinking of Treebeard here. Yeah, well, the, there's a ditch around the, the hedge that you can actually see is buttressed in some place to uh, stop erosion. Yes, yes, exactly. So we have the uh, this this... Yeah, this dike around here, and we'll get to the, we'll, we'll we'll look at this in some with in somewhat more detail next time because we're gonna get the uh, physical description of the layout of Bree, um, which corresponds with you know which corresponds quite closely. They've done a really good job on the like the overall map of Bree, but I'm I'm now riding around to the uh you know to the sort of north western side of town because I want to go in this side over. It's it's the hill in particular that yep. I'm sort of interested yeah. in here. Yeah, um, this is the part I was thinking of when we were talking about the human houses and the hobbit houses. Right, exactly. Um, so I want to see I want to see how we depict that here. So we've got some. There's a gatehouse. All right, there's a gatehouse. And so here down here we have some we have an estate, right? We have some uh, some human houses down Definitely here. Definitely human houses here. Right, and if we look now here, we're coming back down into the center of town, 
that we just came from, right? All people houses Absolutely. down here yeah. at the foot and that, you know, we'll farm down there at the foot of the hill. Uh -huh. um, but then if we go up onto the slopes of the hill, um, we do get right. Hobbit houses set into the sides of the hill up here. A few more up there too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, you can see it's kind of economical, but it does go against that one statement that hobbits hate heights. I mean, does a level grade of a hill really count? Well, I mean, see, obviously it doesn't because, you know, Bilbo and Frodo live at the top of a very tall hill, so does... Well, know, exactly. They Brand, don't like... Uh, Bug and the Great Smeals. Right. They don't like going upstairs, but I'm not sure... Um, I'm not sure that they... Disli that they dislike... I know, you know, Sam doesn't like looking down from a height, but that's from the edge of a cliff, right? Yeah. Um, well, that, that patio in front of the, the <laughs> in front of Bag End is pretty daunting. Yeah, exactly. You would think that, uh, yeah. I, I mean, I've got to think that the hill was a little more gentle than they depict it in the game. <laughs> um, though, yeah, you know, it's I mean, an easy way to get to the party festival grounds. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And so then here up at the very top of this path, which is not even paved, right? This sort of dirt path that we've been following here. We yep. have the ruins of an Arnorian tower. Yep. And this, of course, makes good sense, right? That the Arnorians would have built like a watchtower up here. And I really like how it's pretty much independent of the whole rest of Bree, right? Um it looks down over the town and if you look over there's nothing there's like no native brie structure that is on this level like the yeah, brie you get the feeling yeah this is like the the secret place that the young men go to smoke where the parents won't catch them sort of thing <laughs> right because and that that by itself is kind of intriguing Right. Um, and an interesting little sort of piece of interpretation, I think. Um, on the one hand, Bree is clearly described as being a town on a hill. And yet in the game, they've made they've made the town uninterested in the hill. You know, you, you, yeah. s you see what I mean by that? Um, it's, it's a town despite the hill. Yeah, it's next to the hill. Um, it's sort of under the hill. But it makes sense that I mean... But I, I, I don't dislike what they have done. I mean, on the one hand, okay, well, so a couple different things. One. Building on a hill is tricky for one. Building on a hill is tricky, yes. Um, it's almost like in the game they've gotten themselves into like a reverse scale problem, right? I mean, on the yes. one hand, the scale there, there, you know, we've talked about the scale problems, that like how everything has to be kind of closer together. You can't make... Uh, you know, you can't make points as far apart as they are in in the book, uh, or else people would just be traveling forever. And so, you know, going from Breed to the Barrow Downs is is a matter of seconds, um, and it's obviously not that close to Westgate. But nevertheless, um, here in Bree, I think we have really exactly the opposite problem. That in order to make Bree look like a significant. Uh, a significant town, right? Um, uh -huh. If it's on the hill, the hill would have to be huge to accommodate it, yeah, the size it, of this town, right? Yeah, yeah, it would be. It'd be... Um, I, I, yeah, I really can't think of anything similar to that. And to have a hill that size, it wouldn't be a hill. It'd be some sort of geographical altitude at that point yeah exactly and it's as like i said it's, it's sort of a weird scale thing because i don't think that this means that they've made brie too big um no. in in the passage we it didn't look like a good size yeah this... well in a passage we didn't quite get to tonight tolkien numbers it he says there are about a hundred houses in brie and i don't think there are many more than a hundred houses in brie as we get it here um i mean i i i think they've got the size about right of the town. Um, but on the in-game scale, a town of a hundred houses, if you're going to make that all on the slopes of a hill, I, I just like, because of the way the scale works, it, it takes you as long to, I mean, th think about it this way, riding from one end of Bree to the other, right? Mm -hmm. 
takes you as long as what? Getting from Bag End to, you know, getting from Hobbiton to Stock almost. I mean, uh-huh. not, maybe not quite. Maybe Frogmorton. Um, maybe Mickle Delving, right? But I mean, it's as far as the amount of strides that your character takes in game, it's it, it's a big stretch of land, right? And, and, be- and before they even expanded it, even before then, it was a maze. I had so much trouble navigating it my first time, and it took yes. months before I was able to memorize anything by sight. And then they made it bigger, and then, you know, I must feel like the hobbits looking at all this and going, how in the earth am I going to find anything and get there when I need to? <laughs> exactly. And that's, of course, another thing, is that one of the things that they clearly wanted, I mean, it seems that they really wanted to represent is that sense that when you get to Bree, you should have that, you know, country bumpkin, wow, I'm in the big city now feeling, right? Like, you know, th- yeah. they want to replicate really the do. feeling that Sam has. Yeah, and you do. If you start the game as a as a hobbit and you're wandering around the Shire, when you first get to Bree, it feels like the big city. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I think that they, they've done that very effectively. But I, I, as I say, in the end, I think they were smart to make the change that they... It is a change to put Bree in the Valley, essentially, underneath the hill here. Um, but here's what I like about this spot, right? Not only that it acknowledges the history, right? That the Arnorians around here would certainly... You know, howsoever Bree land may have been involved in the Civil Wars, and there's lots of thinking that we can do about how that may or may not have happened or what Arthodyne might have done and what role they might have played and what relationship they might have had with the Brelanders, none of which were actually told in the books, right? But we can speculate about all those things. However, like, surely the very least they would have done is build a watchtower up here so that they could, you know, spy out the movement of their enemies because this is the biggest hill, you know, for quite a ways around. Um, yeah. And yet... I kind of like the fact that in the game, Bree itself, the Brelanders themselves, seem totally uninterested in this height. Like, no one is built here. No one has used this for anything. Um, the hobbit holes in the side of the hill are the only thing that we get up here. They don't want to look around. What, what are they going to look at? Right? <laughs> That, that you reminded me that the fact that we're given so very little information about Bree and its people and its history, it reminds me a lot of when I lived in London as a kid, where, you know, coming from, a, you know, the United States, where our our history can be measured in inches, or theirs is me- measured in miles. Right, right. And just, you know, how uninterested Native Londoners were that, oh, this was built out of a Roman wall. Right. This was, you know, this this area was uh, sacred to the Druids, you know. Right. In, right. Like <laughs> thousands of years ago, this is the part that was burnt down and rebuilt. The you know, fourteen famous architects built different parts of this one street, and they're just like, this is just where I live. This is right. That's right. Like I already know all this. I already know all this. I grew up knowing this. Why are you so impressed by this? Yes. 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 Yeah. No. I know. I know just what you mean. Um, and uh, yeah, but the, the, so the, 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 they don't they don't care that these ruins are up here. Um, but what's more, they don't like why would they want a view? What would they look at? There's nothing to see here. I mean, other than the town, but they live down in the town. Like there's nothing to the south. There's nothing to the west. Right. Like what are they going to look out for? Um, you do you. Do you see what I mean? I mean, it's like that mm-hmm. by not having them up here, not having watchtowers, not having them looking out from the tops, it emphasizes the way that Bree is like just sort of inward facing, right? They, they don't look out. They're not interested in surveying the countryside. It's self-contained. And there's nothing like Bree that we really encounter. Uh, I mean, even on the scale until like Minas Tirith or something like that. Yes. In, in, the, in the game, at the very least, we're not introduced to this type of settlement, yes. this, this settled, ancient settlement of people for who are just sort of complacent in it. And, and that's the other thing, unlike, unlike the, the lands we're going to visit later, these guys are complacent. Nothing so far has come to them from either side. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Um, it, it occurs to me to wonder, can you get up onto the very top of this hill? There's more I up there. I tried so hard. Already. Oh yeah, you can't. <laughs> yeah, okay. that was a that was a weird sick day. 
Yeah, I. Uh, there, there are definitely parts of the game where I have exerted myself in a similar way, but I was just, cause like, it's so close. It's so close, yeah. but you can't get up there yeah, at all. It looks so close. It looks so close. Yeah, and I'm noticing some houses back up on this hill that you can't get into. Up here, you see, it, like, they actually are up the hill. You can see the roof stuff from over here. Wait, which direction? Uh, just over the Prancing Pony. There's a little cleft in the hills over there. Oh, right over there on the other side. Oh, yes. Those are up. Yeah. Are those the one, like, up behind Bill Fernie's house? In that direction? No, that's further sure. down. That's further down. Yeah. 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 Well, that's Prancing Pony right beneath us right there. Right, exactly. The big square building there. And I love the addition of the stable yards on there, too, because you would need that. Yes. Yeah, we do get a nice bird's eye view of the Prancing Pony here. Yeah, um, the community parking lot. <laughs> exactly. All right, well, let's, let's, let's drive around a little bit. Speaking of parking lot here, let's let's go around and uh, look at the look at the exterior a little bit. Well, there's the, it's also the, it's interesting with the hobbits being up higher and the humans being down lower. It's almost like you know it, it's almost an even playing field. At that right, <laughs> right. It, it, at least, sort of, you know, psychologically, if nothing else. Right. And I agree with you. I don't think there's some seedy, you know, underhanded. I don't think there's an anti-hobbit league lurking under right. the depths there. But that being said, I'm sure there's just that sort of casual, innocent racism that exists between Moel meeting people right. without right. really thinking about it. And that's, that's I think, what Tolkien hinted at with that sort of view, that each one sort of, you know, was essential to life. You know, well, what would life be without the humans? Well, everything would be our size for one thing, but honestly, <laughs> I guess we kind of need them. Right. Right. The, the fact that they have to acknowledge it is the idea that they've thought about the matter. <laughs> right. Okay, everybody with us? All right, here's what I want to do today. I want to focus on the passage, the passage that we were looking at. So in particular, I want to think about Bree as an island in the empty lands. Right? So we get that we get that we got that little piece of description again we'll 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 do more with the details of the architecture of brie and this wall surrounding it which i find very interesting um Mm -hmm. but uh but i want to i want to think about i want to kind of go around the perimeter not 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 the wall but the sort of the the edge of town here and see what we have surrounding it so right here immediately we have two things here. Now, this is the Greenway, obviously, right? We can see the old uh-huh. paving stones, but it's overgrown. Um, I'm interested in these two walls, right? We have, on the one hand, the old, obviously, Arnorian construction yeah. here, right? This was a wall, maybe by that rounded tower, maybe even a fortress of some kind? Or maybe a branch of the walls that are inside the gates. Right. Yeah. That straight across there, well, I'm looking straight to the northwest, and over there you can see, I think that's part of the the wall, the boundary wall, mm-hmm. right, that we were looking at before. That kind of, So this yeah. is sort of part of that wall, which seems like it probably... Um, it probably... Thank you for giving me the Nika Breaker Slayer deed. Um, uh, <laughs> that that this wall seems to have uh, closed in the Barrow Downs, right? Um, uh, anyway, so we get that, but then we get this wall, this stone wall, inside that, and right along next to the road. And I'm trying to figure out this wall. This looks like the kind of walls you get by digging stones out. Of, it uh, sure does. Things. I mean, it's far neater than, say, the stone walls that we have all over the place here in New England, which, because we have so many rocks in the ground, um, that when you plow a field, you end up with huge heaps of stone, which it's better to make into walls than to leave in huge heaps, um, taking up a lot of space on your land. Um, Just like Ireland. Exactly, exactly. Um, so, but it's very neat, and it looks like it's. Uh, is there mortar? 
in these stones? No, they're just, but they're set carefully. Look at the little ones wedged in and everything. This is clearly a, a carefully constructed wall. Um, and it's old. There's moss growing on it. Yeah, it is old. It's not ruinous, though. Is this a more modern wall? Yeah, maybe. It, it's almost like a don't play on the ruins wall. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. To keep the kids off the ruins, you know, is this the, like, so, you know, when you take the elementary school trips out to see the ruins, like, don't go past the wall, kids. Um, Seriously. Oh, and, uh, th- th- and that tourism of that sort had been going on in England for much longer than <laughs> right. we think of tourism. Oh, goodness, yes. Yes. Uh, think of the comments, the, think of the tone in which... Uh, Elizabeth Bennett refers to that kind of tourism in uh, yes. in Pride and Prejudice, that, where it's obvious that it's like been going on forever. It's cliched to her, you know. Yep. Yeah. Well, yeah, uh, yeah. Going going to the going to Derbyshire and the lakes and that sort of thing. Yes. But no, I was thinking Canterbury Tales. Yeah. Yeah. Canterbury Tales. People were taking tour- tourist spots to places that were centuries older than them. Right. Right. Yep. Also very true. Yeah, pilgrimages are sort of different, but similar as well. Um, it's, a, it's a form of t- destination travel. <laughs> it certainly is. Certainly is. And sightseeing. Yeah, that's certainly how uh, many of the pilgrims, such as the wife of Bath, saw it. Um, but this wall, anyway, so back to this wall. So I'm thinking that this wall looks like a boundary wall that was built by the men of Bree. Um. And I'm wondering if this is an indicator of, like, this is where, if we're supposed to understand this as something like this is the edge of their domain, right? This is the edge of, like, you know, beyond this is the, is the, uh, this is the, this is the border of the island, you know. Uh, you know, beyond this is empty lands. And certainly to the west of, jurisdiction. yeah, to the, to the west of this is, uh, uh, is Barrow Downs, obviously. Well, let's keep, keep going our, our rough circuit around the land again. Oh, when was the agreement made that the hobbits would not be pestered? Later. Later. Yeah, we don't have any anti-hobbit pestering rules until Aragorn passes them, I think. Oh, that's right, yeah. I mean, not that many people did pester hobbits prior to that, but... Um, but I guess the wall more signifies, you know, the guards are not going to chase anybody after this point because they just can't be bothered. Right. Right. That's a fascinating oh. wall. The yeah. one right along the, the the southern edge of the lake over there? Uh-huh. Now, most of those are uh, insect domes of the Nika Breakers. They have right. these little sort of termite yeah, mounds. Yeah, they're mounds. Right. But but that, that wall over there, who built that wall? Hmm. Is, is that another boundary? I was looking at it the other day. Why would you do that? Not careful, there's turtle catchers in here. I oh, yeah, sorry. Excuse me, turtle catchers. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Do, do you think? Man? No idea. No. It idea. looks like the stuff at Esteldin, a little, but it's got the it's got yeah. the Anorian star on it. Right. Right. Yeah. So it's less plain than the ones in Esteldin, but. I mean, I guess it's just going from one place to another and right along inside the lake. Maybe this lake wasn't there back in the day. Uh, yeah, maybe this is just drainage. You can yeah. see drainage has been a problem with all the shoring up they have to do. Right, right. Yeah, probably so. Yeah, I'm going to guess that the, uh, these wetlands weren't there when that wall was originally built. But all of these different Arnorian walls, you can see that... Uh, we can already see them before we step into the town. Well, I, not that we didn't start in the town, but anyway, you know, it, but before we really investigate the town, we can already see that the in the game world, as they're fleshing this out, they're imagining that the Arnorian kingdoms kind of built around Bree, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, all of these ruins give you the sense that when, you know, Arnor was in its... Uh, uh, was in its heyday, there was this like 
massive network of Arnorian structure, at least boundaries, if not actual structures. And but but the Brewanders were still just kind of living in the middle of it. You think they had aqueducts? You know, I wouldn't be shocked, but I don't see anything that looks obviously aqueduct. I mean, maybe they put aqueducts on the top of the walls, but normally you wouldn't build a solid wall. At least Romans wouldn't build a solid wall uh, to uh. put the aqueducts on. Um, and here we get some more of these roads, but this is these are Brie roads, right? Mm-hmm. As we see this one, again, more modern roads, this one leading to an outlying farm. So we have one outlying farm here. Now, of course, Tony, as you were saying, the empty lands about uh, Brie are not quite as empty as they're described in the in the in the book, um, but again, this seems to be more a scale thing. I wouldn't imagine that. Um, I I wouldn't imagine that there were no outlying farms around Breland, right? That the land about them is literally empty of any inhabitants. Um, it's just not called. It's just not tame. It's just not like the countryside of the Shire, right? Um, but there probably would be isolated homesteads out uh, in the more remote areas and stuff. And then, of course, like since because of the scale issue, you run across them relatively frequently here. But it does seem that they're trying to create this sense of of emptiness, of barrenness, that we've come across more ruins than we have, you know, houses and people. Certainly. There's still that Arnorian wall going along. to, And this, of course, is the road coming south out of Bree, just as it's described in the book. But I want to keep circling around Bree here. Is that a copper deposit? Oh, wow. Yes, it is. Oh, uh, we're, we're in copper country. Yeah, I forgot that we were in copper country. Okay. I know. Bree seems so treacherous compared to some of the other places. Yes, it does. And that also says something, the fact that every, everywhere else it's a lot easier to get to, but you kind of have to earn Brie because yes. it, it, it's telling you right off, this is not a walk in the park in Brie. Matter of fact, the tour of the town gets you mugged. Right. I mean, I think that was brilliant. That was a brilliant it addition. Really was. The idea that's like, let's here's the dangerous part of towns where you will get mugged. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. Okay, so this is Staddle here, right? And and I I'm interested in uh, like Frodo. I'm interested in history and geography. So uh, <laughs> I'm 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 wanting to. Who are Hobbit homes? Yeah. Here, can we? How, how high can we get here? Can we get up? No, I um, can't get up there. No, okay. Not All right. I I was wanting to see where I could see them both at once, just to kind of see because so straight. All right, so if I if we go to... Oops, I'm on top of a hobbit house. That's rude. So um, rude. Okay, so this is the <laughs> gate, the Staddle Gate from Bree. That's Bree Hill right there, right? Mm-hmm. Just to the north and west of us here. Um, so this yeah. is the bottom part of Bree Hill. So we have... Uh, so really what we're imagining then is, again, not Bree on the hill and other villages like Staddle under the hill, but... Bree on one side of the hill and then Staddle on the other side of the hill. Uh, well, and that would make sense from a defense position to have your back against something that can't be surmounted. Right. And then as we can see, so I'm just looking at the map here, um, then Coombe is on the other side. So we have basically this hill sort of highland area right in the middle Bree in the valley on one side of it, Staddle on the other side of it, and then Coombe up to the northeast of it, with Archit a little farther removed up towards the Chetwood. Uh-huh. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So that's in, so that's another effect that they have created by taking Bree off of the hill and putting it next to the hill or under the hill is that they've made the Breelands a little bit more sort of ge- geologically egalitarian, right? They're all gathered uh-huh. around, you know, the, uh, the same hill there. Um, Which sounds a lot like, you know, some of the more major towns, how they grew and developed and became, you know, the giant cities we know. 
Right, right. Now, it's interesting, actually. In the game, we have hobbits and um, humans interacting with each other much more than we do in the books, I think. Um, I'm thinking, for instance, of like the constable over in Combe, Mm -hmm. the hobbit constable that you have several. I mean, so like you've got members of the guard there in Coombe, some of whom are obviously hobbits and many of whom are men. Right. Um, Mm -hmm. That kind of thing is I'm not sure something that exactly fits with Tolkien's description of it, though it might. I'm not even, but even the fact that we have all these humans here, like the constable, right? The const, constable tangle rush here um, mm-hmm. is Great plant names. <laughs> exactly uh, is human, right? And you'd sort of wonder, well, why if Staddle is where most of the hobbits are, which of course, as we can see, you know, we were told that in that paragraph that we read, and we can see, of course, we do have almost exclusively uh, hobbit houses. Yeah, here. The flags here are different; they don't have that. Yeah. Well, it's, it's Staddle. It's not. I mean, it's not connected to Bree. Right. Yeah. Is this the? Is this? Is this? Is this the Staddle banner? Yeah. With looks the, like with the three trees, trees on and, a hill. Yeah. Looks like trees on a hill. Is that an yeah. owl underneath it? I can't really tell. I don't think so. No. Kind of looks like two green eyes and a wing stepping up, but I'm not sure. It's probably just a fancy crest. I'm like turning my head to try to see the owl. I think I see what you're talking about at the at the at the root of the trees. Yep, at the root of the trees, they got those little green nods, and it almost looks like it goes into it like uh, wings. But I'm probably just reading into the negative space there. I like it. <laughs> um, Don't know what Staddle has to do with owls, but I do like it. <laughs> right. <laughs> Right, but on. yeah, no, it's you, you get the feeling that uh, the human constables might be rather harshly looked on by the townsfolk as interfering. Yeah, one would think they might be. Okay, now I'm, like, I'm wanting to con- live. I'm wanting to continue to right. I mean, they can't live there, right? They don't live yeah. there, presumably. Um, now here we have a ah, the crumbled court. A crumbled court, a big ruin. Just out, but again, just outside. There's there's the gate of Bree, right? Uh-huh. The Coom Gate of Bree. Court implies this is some sort of either judicial or luxury kind of thing. Yeah, a, a courtyard at least, right? Yeah. Again, you get this sense of like this whole Arnorian, you know, world going on around, you know, built around Bree. Uh, and so then down here, there's Coom down in the valley. We've got the wooden palisade around Coom. Uh, and they're down much more steeply down into the valley. Coom feels like much, much more like a valley than either of the other two, Stadler, uh-huh. uh, or, or Bree. Yeah, it's much more claustrophobic and boxed in there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But no, I, I love the little little mysteries they leave you with all the Arnorian ruins. I'd actually love to talk to a developer and see like if they had some sort of plan for that one. But yeah, yeah. Gosh, they did, it was done so long ago. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, cool. Well, so this anyway, we we we've gotten a bit of a a survey of the t- of the of the towns here. Um, well, of anyway, three of the four villages. Uh, we haven't been up to Archit, which is, as I said, a little bit further removed, and we'll get there. Um, but I just wanted to look at the layout and how the whole thing has been kind of conceived here. Um, and, of course, we can see in-game clearly their answer to the question, but wouldn't the Arnorians have been here, too? You know, they've come to the same conclusion that we did. Looking at the map, there has to have been a heavy Arnorian presence here. And we find that clearly this must have been a centerpiece for Arnorian military focus because of all the walls, right? You know, we it, it's very clear that this was a point of defense, right? And yet, 
the Brelanders don't seem to have been completely absorbed, certainly to have held themselves independent. But we'll see more of that as we explore the town. Next week, I think we'll look inside Bree Town in a little bit more detail because we'll get to the physical description of Bree, and uh, especially as they approach the Prancing Pony. So we'll uh, we'll see a little bit more of that next time. But I should exciting. I should let people finally go to bed because I'm keeping everybody super late tonight. Thank you all for your patience tonight. And uh, I look forward to more discussion next week and then more exploration of Brie thereafter. So thanks for joining me, everybody. Bye now. Good night. Thanks for joining me on this epic exploration of the Lord of the Rings and of Standing Stone's video adaptation of Tolkien's story. If you are having even half the fun I'm having on this journey, I hope you will consider supporting the project by donating at signumuniversity.org fund.